bist du sehr aller Ehre. Was ist Wundes hier geschehe? Dass ein Magd ein Kind gebar, hier über alle This is The New Right, a podcast of the Lost Arts, reclaiming the literary holy land from the heathen. Uh, this is Matt Pegas, and I'm here today with a very special guest, a bit of a, a dream guest of mine, in fact, Alex Kazemi. I'm saying that. I'm saying your last name right, right? I, just want to make sure. I, I, love, I love the way you said that. I mean, it's Kazemi, but I Kazemi. love the okay. interpretation. <laughs> All right. Well, from, from here forth, it will be Kazemi whenever I say it. On this pod. Um, but Alex is a pop artist and a writer. He is the author of the book Pop Magic, A Simple Guide to Bending Your Reality, which we'll discuss today. Some of you may have seen me write about this on Substack or perhaps mention it on past podcasts. It's a book uh, that has had a pretty massive impact on me since I found it about a year ago. That and Alex's work in general has had has had a pretty pretty huge impact on me, and, and we'll get into that. Um, but uh, I have a little blurb here, which I'm going to read on you, just in case um, for any of our listeners who are not familiar. Um, you are something, uh, I don't know how you describe yourself as a, a, an underground influencer, or, or maybe like an underground creative director is, is the yeah. better way of saying it. Um, but I, I say that I, the underground part is to say um, that a lot, you know, many of our listeners, many people in general public probably haven't heard of you, but they've definitely heard yeah, of yeah. people. They've definitely heard of people who've heard of you, heard of people that you've worked <laughs> yeah. with, corresponded with, collaborated yeah. with. And I don't want to get too name droppy here, but I feel like it is the proper Alex Kazemi intro to, you know, talk <laughs> about yeah. your curriculum <laughs> vitae. Yes. Um, but, you know, you've famously gotten shout outs from Madonna and Taylor yeah. Swift, corresponded with. Lana Del Rey, Selena Gomez, Camille yeah. Paglia um, yeah. collaborated yeah. with Ariel Pink, Marilyn yeah. Manson, Diplo. Yeah. Rose McGowan wrote the forward to your book. <laughs> Bella so Thorne funny. blurbed it. <laughs> Shirley yeah. Manson uh, uh, described you as a boy wonder. Brett Easton Ellis, who I gather is a friend. Uh, very close friend. Yeah. Very close friend described you as his favorite uh, millennial <laughs> provocateur. And again, I, I only get name dropping because I think it it's perhaps the best way to sort of start yeah, to intro, you know <laughs> your 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 sort of work I, I you know call it I, I would describe it as a sort of like a cult culture jamming uh I don't yeah. know there's a lot of ways you could you could describe it a pop artist does seem to be this um, intro is like the perfect deconstruction of Alex because I'm really, like, <laughs> like it's the perfect intro it's hilarious well I'm I'm glad to be able to provide it I mean yeah I do think pop art you know it's it, there is something Warholian about a lot of what you do both aesthetically yeah. and and in terms of the people you know uh did you I mean Wikipedia describes you as a pop artist is that yeah does that I mean, resonate? I think, yeah yeah it does resonate because I think like I've always used the arena of pop to try to translate like underground ideas to people. Mm -hmm, exactly. But also um, pop magic was also a mockery of a lot of like the modern world. And it's like sort of like 1-800 pop magic. Like I was mm -hmm. sort of, I wanted to sort of bend people's minds with this idea of like presenting this like kid with all of these cosines, all these things to try to, make people inter like interrogate the surface of what I was giving to everyone you know yeah because it because it because it's very like almost like the Alex Kazemi simulacrum is almost like a comic book character or something it's so like mm -hmm. hyper real yeah no so your goal and we'll get more into the contents of the book later of course but your goal was to sort of you know the the, the pop is like the surface level and then you go deeper yeah no for sure I wanted yeah. to like infiltrate um, pop, um, occult ideas into kind of like McDonald's pamphlet level exactly. language of the occult because I feel like that's the number one thing that you're not supposed to do with the occult because you exactly. know, the occult community is very you know these dudes who wear robes and read Aleister Crowley and it's very like um, gatekeeping and 
very pretentious. So I kind of like wanted to disrupt all of that with the most like Americana, like pop culture thing that would kind of drive everyone crazy. <laughs> no, no, a- absolutely. I mean, I think, so I don't want to give, yeah. One of the things that I think turns a lot of people off by the occult is, is that element of it's being shrouded in not only just mystery. Well, it's good that it's shrouded in mystery by definition. That's what it is. And that's, you know, mystery yeah. is wonderful. Mystery is the lifeblood of, of everything. But yeah. That being said, there's, you know, there's <clears throat> a certain gatekeepy uh, type nerdy. of, of mysticism. Yes, yeah, frankly, nerdy. Yeah. And, and just gatekeepy kind of mysticism that turns a lot of people off. That makes people, you know, think of cults and all kinds of other horrible yeah, things. Yeah. And I think and, I genuinely yeah. throughout the book, though, there was like a performance art and an art- artistic element for me that was more about, you know, controlling people's perceptions and, and making them want to challenge the world around them. There, there was a very genuine desire to share the occult and magic for people to benefit their lives and deprogram from our current society and to feel inspired that they can really do anything. Like I think a lot of the pop cultural stories in the book are a bit of a metaphor for anyone's own personal goals. You know, like I use an example like Taylor Swift to sort of say, okay, well that could mean something else for another person. That's a different mountain that they want to climb. If I could do it, you know, why can't the world's like, um, why can't you bend the world to your will? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I don't know if this is a stretch, <clears throat> but, and you see, I've seen other, I don't know if you're familiar with like Sean Partridge. No, for no. Example. Uh, I, I'm not like uh, in depth. I don't have an in-depth knowledge of him, but he was sort of, all, yeah, I would describe him as a similar sort of pop occultist who was active with the sort of Adam Parfrey yeah. uh, apocalypse culture scene. Anyway, I only bring him up because his, his whole thing is like, uh, worshiping the partridge family for one oh, it's, 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 it's basically satirical but the but the key notion i'm trying to unpack there which maybe will resonate with with what you were trying to do is the notion that celebrities and cultural figures are kind can almost be these sort of archetypes yes they're yeah. they're, they're viewed as yeah the archetypes and deities because our as camille Polly would say there were there's a spiritual poverty in western culture mm-hmm. so that there is this concept of okay well my life is so meaningless. I'm going to worship like the femininity of Ariana Grande or something, you know, like these like Gen Zers. I mean, I think a lot of pop stars ultimately don't really have to have high standards to deliver like really great work anymore because of the current culture. Yeah. But like, I do totally agree with that. Like um, I think Manson is such a great example of that. Like the, the false idol archetype um, so larger than life and, and, such a Gen X are presented in the time of MTV consumerist culture, you know, viewed as like this satanic entity of this right. dream, like immaterial figure. And he was so in control of building that perception for everyone the entire time. Yeah, no, I mean, he so fully embodied that satanic archetype more so than any you know previous you know there's obviously always been an element of sort of satanic imagery to 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 metal uh but in the you know in the 90s he really embodied that archetype more fully and yeah i think you're right obviously he was um completely in control of that we'll definitely talk a lot about man yeah, today yeah. i think there's a lot there's a number a of different fun topic angles. what a fun topic. yeah i mean everything well i think we'll probably will get into the you know the current state of of where he's ended up um, yeah, it's but, but to, definitely but to, to not to to get there too fast um mm-hmm. that that what you know when you you talked about your goal with pop magic of um you know bringing these genuinely very subversive uh and esoteric ideas in, in an extremely mainstream package well i know that manson is uh is one of your earliest influences yeah for um, sure and obviously you know it seems like that was what he was doing as well yeah, def- definitely. Uh, but um, I, I think one thing that Manson uh, sort of like karmically with the universe and, and the way that things ended up playing out, I think that he provided a lot of catharsis of hate, greed, lust, all of these darker shadow aspects of human nature, and he brought them to the surface, but he would continue to perpetuate them. There was never an alchemy. They never became light. And I think hmm. that that is a big reason why things played out the way that he did because he was constantly revealing and perpetuating a lot of what we would call, you know, in the occult community, lower vibrational frequencies inherently. And it kind of um, backfired, but I would never even 
after everything, doubt the power of of the impact that he put on on the world. And yeah, yeah. I'm not going to ever doubt that. Yeah, no, no doubt. I I was reading an interview. I think the the fellow's name is Jason Louve. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I don't know but... how I feel about him, but yeah. No, that's that's like a, a while back. I don't know any, that much about him. I only bring him up because in the interview, you guys got into a little bit about Manson, and and he actually like kind of co-signed that idea that like his that Manson's impact on the culture is is understated, um, which is something oh, yeah. I, I agree with. And uh, one one thing, and I'll get more into this kind of talk. Like one one thing that I've really resonated with with your work is I you know I think a lot of the people who've influenced you, and as it happens that you've also ended up working with, to your yeah. credit, um, were are also like really really huge Im, Im influences on me. And I think that that starts with Manson, and a lot of people who think of Manson as just this you know kind of goofy you know they haven't really Rapist. delved more in and <laughs> yeah, yeah. all that would probably you know smirk at that but no really um like when I was must have been like 14 like that's when I really got into Manson and that was that uh, when Eat Me Drink Me came out it you know it was around that time when Eat Me Drink Me came out but I was I was getting into the entire entirety of the discovery oh, like you were like um, on the Pirate Bay torrenting shit uh basically yeah that was that era I didn't have the money to buy you know cds at the time and my parents would never let me bought manson anyway so yeah that, so i, I was downloading it but no but but even more so or as much as the music was that i i must have and i yeah i must have watched every single minute of interview with my yeah manson yeah yeah he was and, like a little like a like a like a guardian you know like an intellectual guardian for that age yeah well um yeah no my, absolutely and like i it kind of before i got into that uh I I was well I don't, I don't need to get into too much of a personal narrative but basically I really do credit in, in a way that I don't I won't like even really qualify this because I was 14 and it's what spoke to me um Manson is basically the person who made me want to do things like write and yeah, like yeah art for sure. and take yeah. movies seriously like everything, everything. the entire trajectory of my life him. yeah, yeah my, my interest in philosophy quote, yeah. quote, and like everything I would root back to kind of Manson as a figure that inspired, you know, cause I was like the, the, the personal narrative part is like, I, I wasn't into like drugs or anything. I wasn't doing anything too destructive, but I was just kind of like a teenage layabout. I, I had mm -hmm. my friends and, you know, there, there, there's a certain, you know, middle America kind of low, lower. Nihilism. Like, yeah. So sort of nihilism or the, it wasn't necessarily experienced as nihilism at the time, but just that yeah, not low, low, low horizons. My, my horizons yeah, yeah, were not, yeah. it was just like, Oh, you, you know, you might listen to my chemical romance and, and whatever. Um, and the Jesus know, of up. suburbia video vibes. Yeah, that yeah, exactly. But like Manson was the one who really was like, you can actually, for me, you know, make something more of your life. Um, uh, and through art and through yeah, diverse yeah. thought. So anyway, I don't mean to derail conversation too much on my own narrative, but I, I gather, and maybe you can speak to this, I gather that Manson played a similar role in your 100%, life. hundred percent. And I really love the way that you articulated that because I've never really heard someone mirror back my own experience with his, with his work like that. And I think um, I once told him that he was sort of like a portal for everything, you know, like, it, and I think that the, the Pandora's box of realizing, oh, okay, if he can do it, then I can. I think that's such an formative thing. And he gave it to a lot of people, you know, and, you know, despite of what ended up happening. I mean, we could kind of get into that later if you want. Yeah, no, we can get yeah. into it now if you want. You know, they don't. Need I to mean, yeah, we yeah. could. Um, uh, yeah. So I think, you know, unfortunately, like the only I, I only have really good things to say about my experiences with him. Mm -hmm. Like when I did the candle magic ritual when I was like um, 21. Right. To, to, to uh, manifest into my life yeah. and all the crazy events happened it was very surreal in the beginning because I think he was sort of doing magic on me a little bit like I would wake up mm -hmm. in the middle of the night and like it would be 3 a.m and he would be like wake up and I wouldn't my phone notifications were off or something like you know or yeah, like he yeah. was when you get into his grid it's like lower vibrational entities like sleep paralysis like he really is aligned with a lot of like uh darker things in the lower mm. worlds happy October everyone um, I think that uh, what I would say, though, is that he was I mean, like, if anything, I was the psycho like I would text him like 100 times to like, like to get the blurb for my book. Like I wanted him to write the foreword or initially yeah. and I kept like bothering him and he gave me that blurb. And then like uh, one time we talked on the phone from like 8 p.m. to like 6 a.m. And like 
I think he knew how much that meant to me because yeah. like of what yeah. you just said. Like he could, mm-hmm. he, he knows that young men like us have, we, we had that formative relationship with him. And so he gave that back to me. So I don't really have anything negative to say um, about all the rape stuff and allegations, you know, yeah. I don't condone anything like that. Right. Um, but I do believe in separating the art and the artist as much as a conf- uh, conf- uh, conf- uh, controversial statement uh, that is today. <laughs> yeah, no, um, I'm obviously on the same page about that. Yeah, I won't even speculate about 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 the rape and I obviously don't condone it. But, you know, we will see. Well, I, I, maybe I shouldn't even say this, but I'll say, you know, we'll see how the trial plays out. I when 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 the trial does happen i mean i i have nothing negative to say per se about evan rachel wood um i, I just don't know what the situation is there. yeah i mean we, yeah, we'll see sure. you know um i, I have I'm a not question saying, for you, know, you sure, yeah oh yeah um like don't you feel like the conversation around like cancel culture has is so like null and void in 2022 it's like this like yes. idea that the main mainstream society is like sort of catching up to the cultural discourse of like 2016 all of a sudden and people yeah, are like that's like, it's very bizarre i mean that's around the time i met mike ma so yeah we will get into mike uh very shortly yeah no um i had cancel culture on my list of things to talk about today not in the banal sense of me asking alex do you yeah, what do you yeah. think of ca- cancel culture obviously i don't i think it's safe to say that you probably are, are not a fan of cancel culture but i think there's as you kind of alluded to um there is, there's an interesting moment for it where it seems to be sort of or what what what, what were you trying to say do you think cancel culture is kind well, of well i think like the, like it's yeah. like a null and void discussion it's like even like the idea of like fetishizing kanye's conservatism as punk or anything these are such like to me arcane ideas from like the mid 20 like the 2010s you know what i mean like 20, yeah no like, like i don't find it to be an interesting like i don't i don't like the red scare podcast at all for that reason like i don't oh, really, really i was gonna ask you about that i was just out of curiosity yeah because i yeah. i don't really feel like these ideas like that like when i went on milo's podcast when i was right. younger and i did a, I sort of was like a proto like red scare i like kind of thing like it was yeah sort of all, you totally were and by, by the way i would recommend anyone go back and anyone who's yeah, listening to this pod it's, it, it's on it. somewhere it's it's a fascinating interview and a fascinating time capsule of 2016 but continue yeah and i think for being like a 22 year old with so much like baseless vapid rage i think like you know what red scare capitalizes on is like the mainstream catching up to what was happening in 2016 but for me yeah. who mm-hmm. having have had lived through it i just find it so boring like i even told brett that i was like you know, like you really find this Kanye shit interesting. I was like, this is the most like myopic, like useless type of dialogue right now. Yeah, it's kind of this weird time folding back on mm-hmm. itself thing. Absolutely. Um, which, Absolutely. Yeah, you could you could cite any number of reasons. Obviously, we're and I want to, yeah, this is we're jumping, you know, like there's there's a lot of different times, no, which is good. I, I'm glad we're kind of jumping yeah, around yeah. my outline where it means that, you know, I was in sync on what I thought you might want to talk about. Yeah, yeah. Um, but no, there's obviously there's a kind of every, you know, culture came to a sort of halt in a certain sense with Trump. And then yep. it kind of came to a halt again or a halt within a halt or a deeper depression within an already bad uh, scene uh, with COVID and everyone being locked inside. And now we are coming out of that. And I think, yeah, there is that sort of like, we are culturally, we're not like, it's a, it's a confused moment. And we kind of pick back That's up. So on, interesting. That's so interesting to yeah. connect the two as like um, pinpoints of, of like bifurcation. Like, like, I think that's so true. Like the idea of um covid you know how many people went like jordan peterson crazy during covid or like QAnon crazy it's like people were like downloading these like expansion packs into their consciousness because they had so much online time they were like becoming these like like um like just charging up like all of their energy to the simulation just like giving it all like like literally like digital camps like not mm-hmm. concentration camps but you right. know what i mean like oh no like, absolutely a digital ghettos at least yeah yeah digital mm-hmm. ghettos and um <clears throat> and we yeah. really i think what really happened like we were talking about millennials born in the early 90s i think what a big um sense of i think why the gen z versus millennial war came up in the what is left of the cultural arena um, was actually directly connected to the grief 
that millennials are feeling that there was no more cultural arena. There was no more yes. resonance that we all knew what movies were coming out, what TV shows were on. There was no one thing that we're all plugged into. And we realized, oh my God, like the camaraderie that we used to feel around subcultures and even mainstream culture is now completely evaporated because of the algorithmic feeds and everyone living in their own micro worlds. And that was a huge sense of grief. And I think that's why everyone went on this weird early 2000s, late 90s binge and this like claustrophobic nostalgia. Mm -hmm. And I think like what we were kind of talking about is like being born in the early 90s, like we don't you feel like we kind of witnessed glimpses of the death of everything, like even yes. since childhood? Yes, absolutely. No, and so we were both born in 1994, and I was oh, kind sick. of thinking, yeah, as well. this, okay, December great. 94, so just made it in. I think it's a interestingly specific year, you know, 90, the whole era, you know, 90, maybe like 93 through 95. It's kind of an yeah. interestingly specific era or generation within a generation, I guess. Um, yeah, sort of like a baby millennial, sort of like tail end of the millennial generation yeah um, we're definitely millennials like i don't i don't identify as gen z at all yeah but you know and as millennials we kind of saw yeah as you said the sort of death of everything but we're also i think young enough as millennials that we have a little bit more understanding perhaps of gen z oh of or, course of yeah course, and, of and, course. and, and I, you know perhaps perhaps even we understand we, i don't know if this is too generationally narcissistic of a thing to say but to put definitely to put a positive spin on it you know it's almost like you know you have that millennial experience of seeing the end of empire what Brady Stanolis would call yeah, it, yeah, empire yeah. uh but you know you understand the gen z kind of put everything in a blender chaotic yeah. thing yeah yeah because yeah. Of, yeah yeah for sure like you understand that well enough to possibly be able to subvert it you know what i mean i think that's someone like you i mean, i don't know what you know margin of your like fan base is Gen Z, but you strike me as someone who would know how to speak, even though you are a millennial, I think you would know how to speak to. Yeah. I, I, I think, I, yeah. I think I am figuring out, but I'm happy that you caught that because I would, I would, I would be, I wouldn't want to deny that I am of the Tumblr generation. And I remember when the peak Tumblr era, when you know <clears throat> the adolescent bedroom wall became digital and right. a lot of young millennial artists um, developed their tastes sexual, um, creative from using Tumblr, you know, exactly. and getting oh, yeah. that, that opportunity to develop their artistic, sensual instincts. You're like, oh, okay. I feel very gravitated toward this Sofia Coppola screenshot, even though I've never seen this movie. Yeah. So there were the older millennials who were like, wow, I fucking hate you guys. Like, you know what nah. I mean? Like, this is so like insane that you guys aren't even really consuming real art. And then I had this revelation the other day and I was like, okay, well maybe in a weird way, like constantly being inundated with like the sort of quote unquote, like most like pinpoint um, gratifying moments from things like as artists made us be like, oh, okay, like maybe I have to stack sharp things upon each other to keep people stimulated, you know? Yeah. If oh, I'm you mean that, that Tumblr aesthetic? Of yeah. Like that Tumblr, that Tumblr era, yeah. because like, you know, I, I, I really, there was a moment when I was like 18 and I was on Tumblr and I was like, you know, I, I really don't like this anymore. Like I want to be yeah. able to come across these quotes in books and feel this gratifying feeling without seeing it isolated as a quote on my dashboard or things like that. Like I wanted there to be more work and discovery in art than just being like handed everything on the internet. Definitely. Yeah. No, um, a friend of this podcast, Catherine D, who's like a, a blogger um, and a, cool. about digital stuff and, and online writes oh, cool. basically similar to what you've just said about Tumblr, that uh, people underestimate its effect on culture and uh, the, the psyche. degree, the, the psyche and and uh, basically that this really, you know, perhaps most importantly, or, or almost one of the most important fundamental things is, is sexually like that's basically t Tumblr and to a lesser extent, places like Reddit really influenced uh, you know, a whole generation's sexuality, basically, for better yeah. or worse. Yeah, yeah, no, for for sure. Like, um, yeah, de definitely. I, I mean, I, I, I think like in the book, I talk about like no fap and then porn, yeah, and and, and thing and things like that, and having to deprogram from all of that stuff, and seeing how it's really rooted in like Kabbalah. You know, the mm -hmm. idea of like yisod 
being your creativity, the sexual organs, like yeah, preserving no, I, that energy. Yeah, unpack that a bit. Uh, I definitely wanted to talk about <laughs> no fap and kind of your understanding of it. Um, yeah, I think what I like about when no like uh, about no fat blowing up around uh, young men is the idea that um, it's about um, ascending your your material animalistic lowest baseline earthly malhut desires mm-hmm. and when you want to accomplish a big goal in life you have to I mean that's why people fast right because you like observe yeah. these sensations like begging for you and you're using your consciousness to not give into it so I don't like the idea of repression like I'm like Camille Polly in that way like I don't like repression I don't like you know suppression mm-hmm. I don't like anything like that but if there's like an al- a conscious alchemy with the energy, it can be extremely powerful because it's teaching you, it's a great opportunity to teach you, wow, like this, this moment of pleasure is so fleeting and transient. Is there a higher, like, how can I turn this into, into something different? Yeah. No, definitely. That's, that's always been my sort of understanding of, of no fap and, and, and like the energy, energy of that is, is basically the, you know, without being like Wilhelm Reich per se, if yeah. You, yeah, you're familiar with him. Yeah. Like, I don't know if I like exactly buy into like some science of like, you know, this is your orgone energy and it, you know, can be concretely either. Oh, like bro to... science. Yeah. 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 Like, <laughs> I don't necessarily, are you familiar with Wil- Wilhelm Reich? No, no, I don't. Oh, oh okay. No, oh, he's no, like, you know, old, older. Yeah, I mean, is what it is. It's just like he's he's one of these older sort of psych, post psychoanalytic theorists who oh, kind of had this life. idea of like, um, you know, yeah. Yeah, everyone has a certain amount of orgone, you know, their orgasm energy and like it can be channeled to different things. Like, I don't know if I directly believe in that as a science, but I believe very much in the, you know, the, the basic idea there that that, you know, you can either basically jerk off or you can sort of through alchemy um, yeah and and it's not easy and there's a reason that it's not easy because it it would i mean kabbalah right has this concept of zim zoom which is like um if you don't give into these little lights like these little lights that are being presented to you throughout the day of like opportunities of pleasure you're actually filling your future self and your future vessel with more light because you're saying i want to expand my soul to contain more light so it's yeah. like push back light to receive more. Yeah. Well, I, I may ask you more about Kabbalah later because I uh, you don't get as much into Kabbalah directly in the book, if I'm remembering. No, but it's correctly. very. So, I mean, every, every every magician is 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 uh, a Kabbalist. Yeah. Yes, because it, modern magic with a K is all derived from the Kabbalah. <laughs> it's fascinating. All right, I'm going to back up a, a step for yeah, now. Yeah, for sure. Um, and basically. I, I want to get into Mike Ma, and uh, but yeah. before that, another you know brief personal story. Basically, how I got into your work, uh, yes, listeners may may be interested to know, um, was that uh, so the debut episode of this podcast, which was in uh, about August of last year, we talked about Mike Ma's books, harassment, architecture, and yeah. violence. I got very, I hadn't really read Mike's books beforehand, um, but I got very into them um i just aesthetically uh they're they're a a great package mike has a kind of you know one thing that you and mike have in common is that i think you both are really good at sort of getting in and getting out when it comes to social media i mean you're a social media abstainer um i have a flip phone a flip phone um (laughs) which is excellent uh mike is on you know kind of I'm some more anonymous account on Twitter, but basically you both are very good. He was also thing. like a, a vine star. You so know he, what I mean? Like, pretty, like yeah. That's what's really funny. Like, that, that is the, perhaps the funniest element of, of all this. But anyway, um, I, I, I got really into harassment architecture. So I'm reading, you know, the dedication of the book yeah. and he, he dedicates it to a lot of people. He just using like acronyms for whatever secret of yeah. reasons, but there's one name spelled out in full, which is Alex Kazemi, which is your mm-hmm. name. And you know, I was into the book enough that I was like, who is this person? He must be significant. Yeah. And I, uh, you know, I, I Googled you and yeah, it was a bit of a, a rabbit hole. Cause I yeah. never, I definitely, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Never once heard your name. Like I, I was completely unfamiliar uh, with you, cool. but you know, I, I learned that you'd written the song, not enough violence for Ariel Pink. Yeah. Um, when I was 19. Yeah, I, I mean, I love. That's amazing. Yeah, <laughs> I, I 
I love that song always, you know, it's always been one of my favorite RLP oh, songs. Oh, sick. Thank you. Yeah. And, uh, you know, obviously that you collaborated with with Manson, you know, and yeah. your friends Mudded with Brett. Scroll. Yep. Mud Scroll. Scroll. Um, is that? Well, I don't want to get too sad. Is that film available anywhere? Yeah, yeah, it's still around. You've okay. never seen I, it? I actually haven't. I I'm I think you'd like it a lot. It, All right, it's, really a, it's really a, like a time capsule of um, the uh, IG weird girl um, aesthetic yeah, that no, was I, really I, blowing up at the time. I apologize. I, I should have said, I don't know why I haven't. I will no, listen don't that apologize. out. It's all good. Um, but no, and then obviously you, you've corresponded with Camille Paglia, uh, yeah. David Lynch, even a little bit. And I, I say all this because, all right. So if I had to make, and I already alluded to this a little bit with the Manson thing, but if I had to make like a list of the 10 or so yeah. most significant <laughs> aesthetic icons, I mean, I'm not like a musician, so I'm not saying I'm directly influenced by some of these people, but like just on like a, you know, spiritual level, cellular level, yeah, cellular artistic level. If I yeah. had to make a top 10 list, uh, no, no joke, like Brett, Ariel Pink, Marilyn Manson, <laughs> yeah. Paulia, David Lynch would all be well, on that list. Manifested all of this. It's all coming yeah. from your own consciousness. It's all fucking <laughs> warped. It's a warped funhouse mirror. Yeah, no. And that's kind of what it felt like to, to get more into your stuff and to learn more about who you were. It was this like crazy, like, how have I never heard of this person um that's a really cool reaction i, I kind of like that and i know like everyone is kind of like you know you should involve yourself in in the matrix so you can influence people more but i i think i think i'm fine with being like a secret that people discover and stumble upon you know yeah no definitely i mean again you uh, you abstain from social media, which I think is awesome. I mean, maybe one day I will be able to say the same. In the meantime, I just have like, a, you know, a thousand subscribers. You know, I, my podcast isn't big enough where I feel like I can just totally, you know, step yeah. back. My writing is a bit whatever. So I kind of glued to it for now. But I, I definitely, I got, you know. It's probably, a privileged space to be in. Yeah. Um, but, but in a good way, of course. But yeah. And I mean, I, I gather you probably do it in large part for your own creativity and mental. Oh man. Like I've, yeah. I've done such like, like very serious magical experiences because, you know, I'm, I'm very much about data and as a magician and just like really contrasting, repeating experiments and seeing, yeah. like, Oh, okay. There's something here. And some days I will do like um, complete like indulgence of like the internet or chaos and I'll like live in those realities and then I'll contrast it to my like very disciplined like magic regimented days and like if you saw the events that take place you would be like holy fuck this is so strange and I'm so definitely yeah. the reason that I stay abstain from social media is because one I think it's important to be a demonstration for young artists and young people and young men um to know that they can create and they can exist outside of that matrix and that, that they matrix, can have yeah. careers and um, make an impact on people and do all these things that they feel like they couldn't without social media. And two, because it is just so fucking bad for my brain and the sensory oh, yeah. overload and everything. I just, no, it is the, the, you know, we speak in, in magical terms here, like the, you know, the, the, the phone, the, computer social media sites i mean these are portals to chaos like yes thank very you, direct thank you. like i mean that is experience thank you me thank you on an extremely visceral level i was thinking about this a lot yesterday you know i was at work and i was you know trying to make sure i had the right notes for the show and i just yeah, kept yeah. getting distracted by instagram and twitter and like i know it's almost a tired topic but it never it's like it's always it, it you know it's not just like some hyperbolic metaphor like no, no these are portals to scrambling your brain these are erasing astral, these your are brain. Astral portals these are, astral are astral, portals. Yeah. i'm so happy you know this because you know that the internet is the terrain of like subconscious mind throw up and it's like <laughs> everything yeah. mirroring what's going on in your in your unconsciousness is all being externalized in this little astral world and i would um you know give your uh listeners like an experiment yeah. that i kind of do all the time is like i grab like a napkin and i kind of pretend it's a phone and i like put my thumb on it and i just like text with the napkin and then i see oh my god like all a phone is is that you're like projecting a hologram oh onto this little thing and it it's making you think that all these things are so important and this is what reality is and it truly isn't it's just a fucking prison it's a trap so yeah. 
you have to free yourself out of about it if if you want to you know yeah absolutely i mean do you maybe this is a stupid question but i'll ask you like do you do you think there is something kind of dark to the inner i know that in your book you talk about how there's not really dark and light magic it's all just magic which i i think is i think there's uh, something I, low vibrational about the internet low because vibrational, a lot of people yeah. are powering remember if you think of uh matching with with things that happens also on the internet too like when I would like be in, like most people when they're in like lower emotional states, they're going to end up on like porn binges and things like right. that, or, or they're going to end up on hate working or they're going to, the internet's going to continue to perpetuate this like fucking weird, like VR, like remember view masters when you were a kid, like the view no. master red toy. No, actually. But... Okay. It's like <laughs> yeah. this fucking weird thing that it's like you, you look into it and it has slides and it and it, it's like oh um, yeah 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 yeah, yeah from the yeah, dollar the, the, store and they had like disney yeah. ones and all that shit of course i do that, remember that's that. all yeah. the internet this is all that it is you're looking into the viewmaster and and the internet usually unfortunately a lot of people just don't have a strong backbone or consciousness when using it that it just ends up bringing up so much lack in people yeah. and comparative anger no, definitely. I mean, I think this is definitely relevant to just so much of what's going on culturally is this experience we have w- with the internet. Um, and I think we'll probably talk more about it, but to, to again, back up a little bit, like, uh, with my mom, Mike. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I guess I'll to, to phrase it as like a, a really a simple question. Like, were you, were you aware that harassment? No, I didn't, I didn't yeah. know anything about that. And Mike has tried to reach out to me a lot, like through the last almost 10 years. Um, yeah. I'm not ignoring him and I'm not ghosting him. And if he's listening to this, hi, Mike, but um, I'm just waiting <laughs> for the exact, I know cosmically there's an exact precision of a thing and an event where I want to reach out to him that I know is going to happen. And yeah. then we will continue talking from there. I'm just waiting. Excellent. It's a biggest delayed gratification. Like I'm a huge, yeah, well, we're talking about that. Yeah. I'm a huge Fiona Apple fan yeah. and I want to listen to the fucking new album, but there there's a certain event that I'm been waiting for to unfold that I'm like, okay, I can't listen to that album until this event unfolds. So it's, it's a little bit of an extreme restriction, maybe a bit OCD, but I don't, no, I, I don't have any no. animosity towards my, well, yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. I didn't think you did. I was just curious. Cause I mean, a lot of, so he, well, let me ask this. Did you, did you, uh, this was my own speculation. Like, did you first cross paths with him on the uh, Milo? Yes. Yeah, so uh, basically yeah, I figured we became so, friends yeah. because Milo introduced us and we sort of bonded over our sort of agony and hate um, towards the world, <laughs> but also like cultural camaraderie. I don't know exactly if i would say that i support like his literature or the way that his work is interpreted because i don't think he does a very he doesn't do a very good job at he he keeps it a very blurred line but i do yeah. think like of of being um a performance artist or believing in all of the stuff that he writes about versus you know creating more of a disconnection through fiction so i do think that what he kind of emboldens in people i don't know if i necessarily like it sure. or agree yeah, with yeah. it no. and i think there is a very um narcissistic almost milo energy to the cult of him and i would be happy to discuss it with him um but uh i don't i don't know like i haven't read him harassment architecture yet. i'm like kind of saving all of these things until certain events unfold but um yeah i will i will check out i i've read glimpses and i'm like mm, i don't know I well, yeah, that. I mean, I wouldn't necessarily expect you to be fully on board with it, like politically, whatever that even means. I mean, I do think he obviously he's even more so than perhaps when he was on. I kind of wish podcast. he was more yeah. apolitical, like, you know but what he, I mean? Like, yeah, you know, he would say that he is apolitical, mm. but he's apolitical in a way that's like that he's apolitical, political. yet he's in, like he's literally his whole audience is is monetized off of like a certain political sect of culture. Yeah, that, that's fair. So then I'm like, and, mm, I don't know. But but what I find most fundamentally fascinating about the the my not Milo, <laughs> the um Mike Ma Alex Kazemi nexus, like the connection between you guys is is what you have in common and what you don't have in common. I think that fundamentally it's not surprising for me to hear that you bonded with him at a certain point because I think 
there is something very aesthetic that you have in common. I think there's a shared, yeah, just, I don't, it, maybe you've there's, sort of there's calmed a down there's, since there's being 22. Like, yeah. uh, like, uh, no, I get it. Like, that, like, I think we are both anti-heroes in our own ways. Yeah. Um, and we both want to influence a certain uh, amount of people in a certain way. I mean, like I'm 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 very happy for the success he's received and like what he's able he's been able to accomplish and 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 reach people. I don't necessarily would I wouldn't necessarily want what he has though. Yeah. No, I I hear what you're I hear what you're saying. Um what was I gonna say here? Like um I think that yeah, I think there is that sort of commonality from from the point of, of kind of standing aside as a cultural critic that you both you kind of both start in that position and have gone in somewhat different directions but i think that your influence on his work which a lot of his readership probably wouldn't fully understand or appreciate is still very much there um, if you haven't read you know harassment architecture gothic violence you may not you know be as familiar with with these sort of references but obviously like his work has become coded very sort of trad um or even christian but at the same time yeah i know and and it's very but 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 it's it's still from a place of contrarianism and needing that reaction and needing that like because he's like a libra right so he's like very bateman in that way like he he exists in the way of surfaces and aesthetics mm-hmm. and like Venetian type type mentalities. And I, and I, I understand it. And he presents things in, in, in a very crafted way. I, I've read a bit, like I've, I've looked at a page or two, I will say that, but um, I, I do see the nexus and um, I would like to have a conversation with him. That's all I'll say. And yeah, when we well, do have a conversation, I will not necessarily agree with what he's done. And I will yeah. tell him that. So interesting. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Mike Ma listens to New Right, but you know, we obviously know people Does he who have know Twitter? him. He he, you know, I don't know if I. Uh, yes, he does have Twitter. Uh, he's you probably he's DM, email him, send him the episode, be like, because I mean, because I mean, talks about you. I mean, I will. Yeah, I'm. I'm gonna. I, I haven't like. I I I really want to talk to him. I'm just waiting for the really exact moment that we need to talk. And I really do believe that moment is coming soon. So interesting. No, no, absolutely. <laughs> well, yeah. The the last thing I'll say on it is like. I, I mean, I, I you you may have read the sort of Substack post where I I wrote about you. Yeah, that was and so I, fucking cool. Oh well, I'm, I'm glad to have been able to do so. But in in that same bit, I I also wrote about Mike's book and some of the stuff. Yeah, no, and no, there, of he, course. He, and that night, talks and I really about agree yeah with your interpretations of things because you weren't completely like blindly following it. Sure. Oh yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, I I wasn't, but at the same time, I think there's a lot. There's a lot in Mike's books that's also kind of in in. Your I books. think I what I'm grateful yeah. for about what I will say is one maybe positive thing he's done is giving an insight and a snapshot to a very modern online internet archetype through the character or whatever he portrays through his work. I think it's an interesting uh, canvas to like explore or interrogate this person. No, definitely. Um, I don't want to take too big of a philosophic swing as I'm sometimes no, want to do. You're a but, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and this may be a total misinterpretation of yours and his relationship or the influence you've had on him, but I do. Okay. So I think there's something to this. Um, and this isn't necessarily an Alex Kazemi original idea, but it's something that you've embodied really well is this notion that we are in a very good age, the age of Aquarius, whatever you want to call it to yeah. practice magic and to sort of tweak and revisit and, and discover in a new light, some of these you know, occult practices and in the Substack piece that I wrote, you know, it's, it's not even just, I don't even view it just as like occult practices, but rather a whole sort of um, syntax of spiritual, human spiritual expression, lighting candles and intentions and manifesting. I mean, yes, these are occult ideas, but they're also inherent to the the world's religions that I do, you know, agree. I think this is an idea that you'd co-sign on that, you know, we're kind of in this age of Aquarius type era where, older religions are in some way sort of dried up on the shore or like there's this kind of Oswald Spenglerian, again, not to get too philosophical, but you know, decline, you know, slow no, no, I, I of completely rec- understand recession of religion yeah. and the role of religion in our lives. And we are kind of in this 
you know, at first a spiritual desert, but then also like there's this hope for renewal and again, to kind of rediscover these older notions and, and kind of become, this is, I guess, kind of an occult thing, you know, practicing it as an individual outside the the bounds of organized religion and sort of rediscovering, rediscovering, you know, spiritualism, basically. Um, um Well, like, well, um, uh, so basically exactly what you said, like, so obviously religion, what, pro, what religion provides to society is order, right? Yes, and, yes. You know, what magic provides for people when they start to get involved in it is, is that it's not the alienation of the dogma and control and all of the premeditated feelings around religion or an idea of God. It's more about, okay, how am I going to actually engage with ritual in my life? Light a candle, connect to the ocean, all these type of things. Mm -hmm. But what do all of these things have in common between Christianity, magic, any Judaism, any spirituality? We're trying to tr transcend the physicality. We're trying to um, revoke the clawing sensation of your own mortality. You're yeah. trying to, to free yourself from this prison of a material world. And the Gnostics would say that that is the basis of spirituality, right? And I think- Yes, yes. And I think what magic provides is, is you can create your own sense of order. I mean, a lot of people could abuse that. I mean, I'm sure, I mean, I know L. Ron Hubbard was influenced by Alistair Crowley and magic for Scientology. I mean, magic can be rooted as a source to create cults as well, because remember, it's like the building blocks. It's the Lego of all yeah. religion, all of, all, yes. of, all of everything. So, right, right, right. I, yeah. I think that, that, um, uh, the reason we've seen such a blow up of magic and TikTok, TikTok astrology and, you know, everyone, what's your chart and all this type of stuff is because we're trying to reconnect to, to the upper worlds or, or the astral. We're trying to leave this, this uh, world. And I even actually think the, the internet using the internet is an attempt to annihilate the self and annihilate yeah. the ego and align and, and actually annihilate the body. Oh, definitely. Yeah. Well, lots to to say about that, but what? So yeah, and I, I I agree with you know with what you're saying, and to, to bring it back to Mike Ma, I think to to take a bit of a swing here, I think that what he is trying to do in his work, albeit in a way that's kind of coded trad and right wing and Christian in a way that your work is not, I do think he is trying to do something similar. He's trying to um, give solutions. He's trying to give yeah. solutions to the cultural chaos but it's a very specific solution that appeals to a very specific demographic in person and empathizes um and resonates with a certain type of human being in society um yeah. that i think a lot of people can you know obviously misinterpret the, the work i mean the thing with mike i've never really sat down and talked to him and been like you know are you a satirist? Like, are, do you, do you really believe in this stuff? Do you really yeah. want to align yourself with this stuff? Is this really what you want to give to the world? And do you really feel like you are a Manson type figure of where you want to be contrarian and, and a poster of hate and, and, and all of these things, or are you in on the joke? Are you in on it? Are you, yeah. you know, and I can't figure it out and I want to talk. It about is, it, it is him. hard to, to say with him. So I, I am curious, you know, when, when and wherever that conversation yeah. takes place. Yeah, I, maybe I we'll it do it. Be, maybe we'll do a, a public reunion. A public reunion on on this podcast or not. Yeah, that would be. But um, no, but I not to not to belabor the point. I just that the again, the nexus, the connection between you two is I think that even if even if his idea of, of where he's taking that notion of kind of. For lack of a better term, kind of recreate, you know, creating his own order you know creating his almost like creating his own religion type of thing yeah uh, you know the 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 kernel of of that and, and this no the the creativity of that i think his creativity in in extolling all these values which again yeah. you may or may not agree with they may or may not be satirical i i i think is probably was probably influenced by you is, is what I imagine. Oh yeah, no, yeah. for sure. I, I, you know what, that's very interesting. Cause if you think of the way I presented myself on that podcast that my, with Milo, I, I said all of these things like Christianity is the new punk religion. It, we need order. And I'm sure Palia also influenced him as well. And I could see how I could have influenced him, but I like, I, I, I like how you're so mystified of how I connect to 
being dedicated to Ross Mark. <laughs> yeah. I'm I... also extremely mystified as well. And I would love to see, you know, I can see how I influenced him. And um, there was a point in time where he did influence me. And um, and by our conversations, I was like, oh, you know, it's really nice to have have Mike um, around and us. But he was a very different person, you know? Yeah, there was well, a, he's, he's changed a lot. You know, there, was a tr- there was yeah. a, a huge... Uh, evolution period where i think he he um as a libra moved with the the current of the internet and everything and i don't know i see his shit more like even jordan peterson vibes i mean that's not a dig you know what i mean yeah but it's like i think it's almost aligned with that and i just i don't really fuck with that like i don't even i don't i, I mean maybe has anyone even has anyone with a fucking brain actually ever really learned something from jordan peterson like I don't really feel like I've ever learned anything from him. Like everything he says, it's like, isn't that kind of fucking obvious? Like, you know what I yeah, mean? Yeah. I mean, that's, <clears throat> well, actually, believe it or not, I, I didn't think, I didn't necessarily think we'd get onto this topic, but <clears throat> I was kind of interested about your thoughts on your fellow Canadian Jordan Peterson, because I mean, I, I see what you mean. And I think that's a lot of people's take on him that he basically just says really obvious stuff. But I, I do think there's like an interesting sub, and I don't know if you've actually, read his stuff or, or i wouldn't necessarily his recommend book it. is a fucking self-help book it is yeah well it's like 12, he's just regurgating 12, self-help 12 rules for life and antidote to chaos so i think the, the what interests to me about jordan peterson is i think that he's and other people have said this i think on an esoteric level he's kind of gnostic or like borderline into interested in like occult type stuff himself because it, it's not he doesn't spell it out in the way that you do, but nevertheless, no, no, I see it. I there see is the par- that sort I of. The well, for, I mean, what one parallel is that he's influenced or like friends with Camille Paglia, yeah. And I, I do think he has that kind of understanding of um, psychology. And but he's become of, a bit of a parody of himself. Like, oh, he's like yeah, a Valium addict now. And oh like, no, it's like, like it's like he's like a megalomaniac in a way. He is a megalomaniac in a way, and it's kind of reflected on him and 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 on his life in this like almost surreal way. Like, like it's he's actually, so history like he was like, like he cries yeah. on air and stuff. Yeah, um, like, like he he was like this was now a few years back, but like he was in like Russia and like like dying of something. I don't know. It's just like this <laughs> insane, insane stuff. Um, but he's always been. I was kind of, because because you have you know, said some things kind of uh, conciliatory towards so, the, the NoFap community and the sort of, uh, you know, not not like men's rights people, but like dudes online. Oh, I of, mean, I definitely wrote yeah. the book mostly for young men. And the, my publisher was pissed about that. But I can talk about that now. I really think yeah. that there is a suffering amongst young men. I mean, even fucking Bjork talked about it like last yeah. week. You know what I mean? Like, it's very clear that there is um, a, a disorder or a collective pain around young men as much as feminists and certain people in the world laugh at it. And I do think, you know, if Jordan Peterson is providing positive solutions and all that type of stuff, but I think like the the idiots who are like, oh, if a girl wears blush, she wants to fuck you. Like, you know, it's that yeah, stuff's yeah, yeah, interesting yeah. from a theoretical point of view. I will listen to any psychotic interesting theory i'm a sag moon like i will be existential and you know non-dogmatic and like mediate any type of Mm -hmm. belief and listen to what anyone has to say but like i think the way that both mike and peterson's work are internalized annoy me and that's just the truth you think it's kind of an oversimplification it's not an oversimplification it's like an idiocy it's like it's like almost people are too stupid to consume it and then they 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 use it as a fucking um like a excuse for their their belief systems like that it's a justification system it's almost like exactly what i see with the left you know yeah yeah that's yeah. why i opted out of everything and i wish mike would kind of opt out of everything and be like yeah well, you know why not opt out but i guess he truly does feel this responsibility to to be this figure this right wing god god to people yeah, yeah right wing god well that's a we talk about we on the you know at the top of this pod we talked about you know celebrities as archetypes and yeah that you when you said right wing god right now it kind of set some life light bulbs off in my head i mean i don't i don't know how cute 
into you probably are because you're on social media to your credit, but the, the corner of the internet that, you know, that this podcast in some ways is part of, um, you know, there's a lot of sort of, I mean, it's not just, it's not specific to, to like right-wing Twitter, but yeah, absolutely. We, we deal with like sort of a lot of, I mean, that's People fine. Feel that, you know, yeah, I, I don't, mean, I don't know I mean, if you're familiar fine. with with Bronze Age pervert, for example. I don't know that. Um, no. you, you know, neither here nor there. But basically, there's there's a lot of people who fulfill that role as, I mean, literally, yeah, like I know, gods on it, like, like it's not even. This isn't even like some 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 me trying to get below them psychologically and say like this is what you you're trying to. No, like they like BAP Bronze Age pervert will actually be like I'm trying to be a god on earth. He's kind of this performance. Yeah, I know, I, but I I um, see it to be like really empty and vapid and i really don't i really i truly agree with like madonna on this topic like you know the, the topic like we can talk about politics in circles and everyone will become a mirror of each other and it's like there's no really real solution in politics what people really need is is they need um the universal laws and things like that to make their lives better and and to not obsess over these uh these vortexes i mean I have a kind of question for you right now. Yeah, absolutely. Do you yeah. do you think addiction is um, about one's attempt to manipulate time, like decrease or speed up the way you're experiencing reality? Because I was talking to someone, I won't name drop, but um, we were having this conversation and he was, I was telling him, you know, anytime that I've been in, in bouts of addiction, I've always wanted to um, make time go faster or I've, I've wanted things to, to end. So what do you think of that? Huh. I've never, I, I've never thought of that before. I mean, I, I guess I subscribe to a more basic idea of like addiction as an attempt to kind of regain the garden of Eden, like kind of the, to, 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 to regain paradise, you know, via yeah, a yeah, path. Yeah, totally, so that, that's totally. not, that's not a, that is far from a Matt Pegas original idea, but that's, so that's, you know, case number one, but then you know, to what, how does that correspond with, with what, with what you're saying in terms of like speed, be speeding up time? Well, don't you find like that, like I've, I've talked to, I've tried to talk about this lots of people, but don't you find that it's very strange how the hypnosis or the immersion of being on the cell phone, how yeah. time can move just like that. Like you can look at 2 PM and it will be 5 PM and you won't feel the jump from two to five. It won't register yeah. to you. Yeah. Right. And then right. here you are immersed so where was your consciousness where were you how could you why do the devices feed on this i mean like yeah it's very fascinating no i think that there is in a lot of addiction an attempt to kind of a little bit like we were talking about earlier with with the internet like in, in, in other topics there's an att- there's a desire to sort of overcome the ego a little bit there's yeah. a a sense of freedom in that but i do think it's just if what you're giving your soul to is something that is not feeding it if it whether it's yes porn, yes so this is this is from um, nature choosing the tree of life versus the tree of knowledge like and and i and oh, i yeah, think yeah. what you exactly said is so beautiful and true because that's the exact feeling is you you there's some weird fucked up feeling that you know that what you're doing is not giving you what you need and yet yeah. you do it and it's like the counterfeit wax fruit version of what you need. A- absolutely um so because like there there's po- and this in a funny way uh corresponds to another topic i want to jump to at some point which is transcendental meditation yeah um, it, 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 uh, which yeah we'll get we'll get there uh but there are positive experiences there are very good and soul nourishing experiences that involve that jump of time i'm thinking about if you, and I, I bet you have if you've read the book catching the big fish by David yeah Lynch. yeah of course yeah i love so that book he talks about his first experience with tm and how 20 minutes went by like that um so oh, I, I, was, I thought I of that, that. when, well, when beautiful. you said the the time thing like that's a very positive losing sense yeah of wow thing. beautiful yeah. but you can also have it happen with video games and porn and you know probably yeah. drugs i don't have that much experience with drugs thankfully but yeah <laughs> so i think that you know in, in terms of the time jump thing it's like it, it's part and parcel of a greater like ego transcendence and there i think are perhaps i'm just kind of shooting for the cuff here but there's there there are spiritually positive and negative ways to transcend ego Yes, exactly, exactly. And I and I think um, when we want to transcend ego, everyone fucking thinks that we're, you know, fucking like Eckhart Tolle, like, you know, all this, like people have such 
preconceived notions, but we're really saying like, we want to hear something past our own consciousness. We want to hear and listen to a river or something deeper within us. And um, I like that you reminded yeah. me, you know, there's also positive transcendence of uh, uh, of time and, 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 and being in that flow state and, and that it's not exactly. all entering through negative things flow state i think that's the, the perhaps the key term i mean there's there's negative you know addiction is a kind of of, of dis, destructive flow state that you get into right like it's it's some you know there is that when you're addicted to something you just kind of you know there is a flow state to the way you're doing it but and it's, it's like exhausting a little bit it's you. it never satiates you but there is still that negative sort of nightmare flow to it like being strapped on to like well i think this is my biggest coaster. my biggest yeah. problem that i've realized as i've gotten older is is that the most you know things that in life are seductive or sexy or, or illustrious like in the way of um the way they're presented are probably the most darkest type of things that will will keep you deviated off of your path and i think that youth hmm. is a lot about um being prone to the seduction of darkness and, you know, which is why yeah. Manson um, is so connected to, you know, a lot of people's coming of age stories of uh, feeling like they've um, exerted right. control over their own shadow or they've seen darkness and they can, yeah. they can, they, you know, you know, why is light not so, as seductive as dark? Because if there is other forces and lower vibrational entities or even whatever, you know, an, an opponent, whether it's the, our, the ego or a real entity of the devil in the world. Um, it wants to, to keep us seduced by those things. Yeah. But th these things are perhaps the darkness, the lower vibrations are perhaps a placeholder for what could be filled by light. Yes. Right? That's, it's a place Kabbalah, right? a place yeah. that's, a, that's a great thing. And, and I think um, that it's an endless spiral, you know, I mean, why, why does everyone think that, you know, I mean, Kabbalah, we have this term called Einsof, which is, means the endless, you know, and, and like yeah. the, the endless light, right? That there's an emanating endless force that we can all connect to. Well, why are all of our Instagram feeds endless? Why is Tinder endless? Why is, why is social media mirroring endless? Because it's a fake counterfeit version yes. of God. Yes. Wow. That really, really resonates. So, um, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, since I touched on it, uh, I did want to talk a little bit about, but I want to talk about more of the contents and pop magic in general, just to yeah, lay yeah, that cool, out. Yeah. But, but one chapter you write about transcendental meditation. Um, and I actually recently did the, like the intro TM oh, course yeah. here in Los Angeles. Um, and uh, I, I just wrote about this on a Substack piece that I don't know if anyone has read it, you know, uh, but I, I did just kind of write a little bit about my experience with it. Um, and, you know, I'm, I don't know if I, I haven't quite had like the profound level wow. experience that David yeah. Lynch talks about yeah, and that like yeah. Tony Nate, I haven't quite had that. So I'm not like a true proselytizer where I'm going to tell people go out and spend 500, 600, how much wow, it is wow, okay. on the class. But I, but I have been practicing it every day, you know, since I started in, in July and, and I've gotten a lot out of it. Um, but, beautiful, yeah, but beautiful. You, uh, you, you're, you're, you're a pretty, Big oh man you know, i mean yeah maybe because like i think uh i don't know because i really remember the feeling of like being in the group during when we were all learning tm like at the center and like there were people in in circle who would be like you know there are certain people here are talking about these like uh, like um ethereal like transcendent spiritual yeah. out-of-body experiences while doing tm and they're like i don't i don't really feel those things and what i would say is is that you know maybe there's a lot of I mean, we don't know, maybe there's layers to un unfold or maybe you're yeah. not allowing yourself to go to that state or you're not letting go enough. I don't know. Like, but I do truly do believe in that state from TM and I've, and that deep state, but I've practiced for like years, you know, and I think yeah. it maybe it takes a while, but I think, I think so what's, too. what's I, beautiful I, I, is that yeah. you've added this discipline into your life. Absolutely. And that's, that's what keeps me going back. I don't have to, this, I don't have to think about like whether or not I want to meditate 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the afternoon. I wouldn't like, I, I basically wouldn't dream of not doing it. It's become this key part of the rhythm of my life. And whether or not I have the full David Lynch catching the big fish <laughs> transcendent experience, um, it doesn't really perturb me. I mean, I, I, I totally 
I believe, you know, I've, I've had positive enough experiences with it and, and experiences of calming down that I have no yeah. doubt oh, that there man. is that, it's insane. that deeper, it, deeper level to it. Yeah. And you definitely notice when you don't do it. I mean, like I've said, like, because I've, I've, I'm a Capricorn rising, like I can, I can live in a very orderly, rigid, like structured, you know, Saturn, um, almost self-punishing regimented world. And then there's that Saj moon in me. That's like, you know, I'm going to, I just want to be a wanderer and I want to explore yeah. and I want to just throw my schedule out. So my life has been oscillating between these two extremes. And um, I think uh, I will tell you that there's, I don't really believe that we can survive without daily self-disciplines. And and, our, yeah. and, and, and I think that the fact that we have the gift to time block and all these type of things and, and take advantage of our schedule is, is just a huge opportunity. No, absolutely. Well, on the subject of TM, and we can get a little bit more into, you know, the other stuff in yeah, pop yeah, magic, for sure, for but sure. how, in a nutshell, how would you connect? Because a lot of people, when they hear meditation, they think, oh, that has nothing, that's not, this doesn't necessarily have anything to do with magic or occult stuff. Like what, what is the next, the connection in your oh, head okay. between like meditation and pop magic? Well, if you're going to be doing magic, you're, and, and you're going to be putting out images and hardcore like emotional states out into the universe to try to to have your manifestations mirrored back to you in the physical world, you're going to need to have a clear mind. And what meditation does is it teaches you to focus. And also what people really fucking miss about magic, it always pisses me off is, is that like, no one is ever saying to you that, okay, you're going to do this ritual and then something's going to appear. What's going to yeah. appear in your reality is like, an event or a challenge that you're going to have to overcome to then change to match with your goal. Did you watch the Disney cartoon Hercules the t when you're younger? You know what? I, I haven't, I'm familiar with it. I've actually never seen that movie. It's, it's <laughs> a very good example of like, you know, Herculean labors. And, and in the point that when we do magic, we, su we summon Hydra beasts. A lot of people don't want to hear this, but we summon Hydra beasts. We summon mm -hmm. things that are going to fucking challenge us that are going to interrogate us because you know the angels and the and the, our spirit guides all these type of people they don't want to hand us and i mean mm -hmm. entities they don't want to hand us anything they want to see that we're worthy in like a herculean way so you have to survive these labors do i of course i do believe in like effortless manifestation and miracles and all this type of stuff but i think for like the big time stuff you're gonna have to face a lot of your lower self Absolutely. Well, we were talking about that a bit with on the topic of Manson and the kind of idea of this is a Jungian idea, but the idea of shadow work and yeah, basically mastering your your lower self. I mean, you think that's a one of the, one of the yeah, like I do one shadow of the, work. One of the, like, yeah. Yeah. No, continue. Yeah, I mean, would you say that's one of the more more like the more initial steps you have to take if you're yeah, going no, to of course, like you, have, that, you yeah. have to go within and do that inner alchemy. I mean magic is really about the internal work for change. It's not about being airy fairy and fucking, you know, doing a, a, a pink candle ritual. And then like the job opportunity, just like showing up. Yeah, that does happen sometimes, but for a lot of it, magic is about evolution and, and yeah. leaving behind past versions of yourself. I mean, and, and, and wanting to move forward and not being in this state of stagnancy when you do like, I mean, I've had a lot of, kids like write me and be like you know your book really scares me I'm like why they're like well because I know that I have to face or confront aspects of myself that I really don't want to if I start practicing magic and I go well that's the whole point you know what I mean like yeah no 100% <laughs> well so maybe we could unpack a little bit more what you said about Manson earlier was was interesting you know that he maybe never moved past those lower vibrations never he was so yeah. he was so so in a state of 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 trauma and um ego and and narcissism in such a, such a way where i mean dude he put the editor of spin at gunpoint when he wouldn't give him the cover you know yeah. like he he lives to build the simulacrum of marilyn manson it's his survivalism it's everything for him like he cannot access brian like he is only manson all the yeah. time 24 7 i've never met anyone who was, was in his circle at the time, anyone we worked with that would ever refer to him as anything but Manson. He, yeah. he, he gave up everything for Marilyn Manson. I do think it's weird that LaVey died before Antichrist Superstar came out. I do think that 
Manson made allegiances with entities or lower vibrational things for fame and power. And I think it really, I mean, look, when you work with like demons and shit, like it's faster. It's like, like demons are about like, like fastness, like lust and yeah. like, 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 like hitting it and you receive it. Like it's instant gratification more like angels, lighter beings, higher vibrational entities. They want to, they want to take you through school. They want to take you through the Mount of Olympus. They want to teach you yeah. heaven on earth. And he yeah, wanted no, it fast. No, that, that makes sense. And I don't bring up Manson again to keep things on like this celebrity talk level. I think it's actually a really interesting example of, of the general sort of process that we're talking about in terms of you know, shadow work and do you alchemize that into light or do you not? And what happens when you don't, uh, you know what I mean? Um, the Kabbalists say that the, the, the person who carries the most amount of, of pain and hate and even evil or darkness has the opportunity to create the biggest light in the world through the transmutation and alchemy. If they, huh. if they put themselves to the process, I mean, you've obviously yeah. read the long, hard road out of hell, right? I have. Yeah. Yeah. So if you hear, if you talk, if you see the way that he was behaving during Antichrist Superstar and all the drama with Trent and like how he was um, doing a lot of Kabbalah and magic and sleep deprivation and he was he was doing everything, he was um, he was trying at that point to do an alchemy of of going from a worm to something bigger. And if you think about the impact Antichrist Superstar had on people in the world and the magic that still is in that album. Um, I think that that is why a lot of people associate that with his peak, because I feel like he was spiritually connected. And in a lot of ways, Madonna was very spiritually connected during Ray of Light and American Life. And people still feel this type of resonance in that time. No, no, definitely. Uh, I mean, obviously, the these ideas of Kabbalah and alchemy, I mean, even just the mere fact that they made their way into a mainstream released, widely purchased album is pretty incredible. Oh, I mean, but, it's, it's fucking insane to think and, about like, yeah. Yeah. And, and with Manson, obviously there, there was an attempt to evolve um, an, an album like Mechanical Animals, you know, even just the color scheme of the cover. Like there, there was, I think maybe some kind of movement towards something lighter there perhaps well, yeah mechanical or... animals i think was very like I, that, I told him that's my favorite record and i think yeah, like me too yeah i think i think what we, what happened with mechanical animals is is that he really embraced like the derealization he felt towards himself and celebrity and then the but again it is a form of like a metal silver chrome claustrophobia because he's like um again suffering through the record and doesn't know how to manage his fame doesn't know how to manage his relationship to celebrity and he's received all the things and he's angry about it like i don't know if it's a real alchemy on the chemical no, yeah i know I, I don't know either but it seems like maybe that was there was at least an intention there oh the, no no the there's other... intention like aesthetically evolved like his simulacrum for sure yeah yeah and then of course obviously not to not that we have to do an entire retrospective on manson but you know the third album in that trilogy is one of my it's a lot of good songs on Are you whatever it's called the hollywood yeah yeah um but it's it's in some ways it's one of my least favorite albums by him i think that the columbine thing made him feel yeah like he thinks he really topical. truly believes yeah. that he truly believes that columbine ruined his life and i was like you manifested that yeah gosh well <laughs> yikes but the, the other record of his that i wanted to highlight um is the pale emperor which is the record he made from around probably around the time that you oh knew. yeah 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 um, and i would say uh, it depends on what day you ask me that that mechanical animals are my favorite albums by him no think, no for I sure i think Emperor is incredible um, yeah no think... for sure there was a point where he was very focused on evolving it as a musician in that point in in pale emperor and he was i mean didn't weren't people obsessed with the record he put out before the rape allegations like he like blew up um, I, you know, I was a little bit checked out at that point for whatever reason. Um, we are chaos, right? I've actually, I should listen to it more. I think I've listened to it only once. I do think it got positive yeah, didn't reviews. I, you, that's the one that I, heaven upside down. That's no, no, there wasn't there one. No, after, there was one. There after was one. After, there was down. one that was like a month before he, the rape allegations. Yeah. 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 I did the um, band ads on, on the heaven upside down stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, which was sort of like a mockery of like kids growing up with Marilyn Manson. Yeah. 
I haven't listened to Heaven Upside Down as much as I'd like, and I haven't listened to We Are Chaos as much as I'd like. But I do think just to 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 keep it on like the notion of alchemizing, yeah, you know, darkness into light or lack thereof. I mean, I think there were glimpses. I'm curious if you agree with this. I think there were glimpses. Of the, and I think his most underrated record, by the way, is his album from 2009, High End of Low. Oh yeah, um, and yeah. I think Wait, there's is that glimpses. with slow motion. Uh, I don't know slow motion. I love on slow that. motion. Yeah, I think I think slow motions on on that one. But um, yeah, um, it's four rusted horses. I don't know. There's um, there's moments on that record and on the Pale Emperor where it's it's like almost like I get a sense of like what a more healthfully evolved Manson could have been, which is like yeah. this kind of older, uh almost like country singer <laughs> like uh or, or i don't know exactly how to how to put it. i'm trying to think of some good good songs that are examples but th- there's moments on those albums where he he seems to have a more a, a better understanding of like kind of his, his how he's gotten older yeah no no and, no and, no and, for sure that and would almost be, really be able to look back on his career as like as a as a as a, as a villain but also like from a relative place of calm. I I, I hear. I, I know that. exactly what you're talking about. It, exactly it seems about. like that could have been more the direction he went and in some ways was going in. He was doing, you know, he's always been very cinematic. And I feel like, um, you know, the whole Me- Mephistopheles of Los Angeles oh, moment on. Song. Yeah. Uh, it's just, the, the, there's like that under understanding of himself as like this, as, as part and parcel of Hollywood and LA and sort of accepting himself as a as a villain within that, but also kind of someone who's getting older and passing the Yeah, no, no, on. I agree with you mean. There was, like, like, there, there was such a beautiful possible direction for his, yeah. his artistic aging. And unfortunately now, um, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's really, again, I don't know the exact specifics of like the case and, and what's going to become of that, but it, but I will simply say like, it is sad <laughs> to see. Yeah, no, it, it is, um, it is really it is sad. I mean, even Rose said, like in the press, she was like, you know, I've only really ever had good scenarios with him. Like, you yeah. know, like she even admitted to that when the allegations and stuff came out. So she couldn't base her own experience with him. So I've, obviously it was hard for me to see all that because it was very confusing. I was like, then who's the real Manson then? Like if, if all of these, if, who's this villain that I'm reading about who I've never experienced, but then everyone's like, you know, that's what abusers do. They protect their image. You know, they're narcissists, yeah. you know? Well, so, yeah, we, we will, there's still time. We'll see how this plays out, I guess. In yeah. The years yeah. It's to quite come. A, yeah, but fascinating. Anyway, truly, I'm not even just trying to talk about Manson to just keep on, you know, Manson, this Manson that I do think that like, you know, some of the listeners, of this podcast, and we're talking about his evolution or lack thereof and the darkness to light. I do think this is very illust- illustrative of, of the kind of stuff that you talk about in pop magic. Um, yeah. Yeah. For sure. So I for think sure. it's, it's worthwhile. This is p- perhaps a question I should have asked earlier in the podcast. And yeah. I obviously know the answer because I've read your book, but I think it would be helpful to say what um, in, in pop magic, how, how do you define magic? Very simply. Um, I, I mean, I, you know, obviously I say like the art and science between like bending reality in accordance with your true will. Yeah. And then I think there's also, um, bringing order to chaos and i think it's more of the latter personally because if you think about it like when i have lived in those visceral chaotic states and i've taken breaks off of order to literally train my mind to see what the difference is to remember the pain of just choosing to live in chaos is seeing like that you cannot wake up every day with this opportunity and say, oh, okay, I'm just going to move through disorder and live life like this, like a chaotic ritual. It's like, no, like you need to sit down and bring order to your life. You need to yeah. break down your goals into practical steps. You need to, I mean, we're here to be the best versions of ourselves. As fucking annoying as that is for everyone to hear, like how nice would it be if we could just like, like what I've realized is that it's way fucking harder to try to be the best version of yourself than to just like melt away as a human yeah. being into the ether oh absolutely so you know it's so easy to choose passivity over you know actually yeah yeah nihilism have have you heard of of, of brett's new book the shards of course yeah no i've 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 listened to it because i listened to his podcast and he's done so i'm 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 reading i have it here like because i have the early copy i'm reading it right now i I think it's probably for me like i don't really fuck with american psycho or any of that type of stuff 
I think the shards is personally to me like the most um, beautiful, vulnerable, um, illustrious version of who he really is as a person. I think so too. And I also think that um, I'm so happy that he, though it's crafted as beautifully, but he's allowing himself to share um, very painful formative experiences of him coming of age through this arena of the shards that is so universally beautiful and visual. I told him that it's like his Taylor Swift Speak Now album. Like it really yeah. is like this. That's a good way. It's yeah, it's so much more personal. Yeah, um, I don't know how much was on the written. pod. It's a really big book. It's big. It's longer than Glamorama. I mean, he uh, cut I think it down. all of it. I think. Um, I think maybe if anything on the pod, I think he was going more on on uh, unedited. So I think if anything. It's the even longer version that was on the pod. Yeah, yeah. The book was um, really long before, the, like, it was even longer before they cut it down. But um, there's something that I really, I'm very excited for people to have this book because I think, yeah, and I, even I if it doesn't read, do yeah. well, I think that's even fucking cool too. <laughs> like, I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, how well does any book do anymore? People don't really read. But I kind of, I kind of have a sense, and maybe it's something I will try to, you know, <laughs> hoping to manifest by saying it here for Brett. I think maybe it'll do like, maybe it'll surprise some people how well it does. We'll, we'll yeah, see. maybe I would, um, I would because love, I would really love that. I think that. So I love his book White, and I know you've reviewed it. It's yeah, a great yeah. book. But I, I think, think I mentioned that, in White. I, yeah, I think you might be. Yeah. Um, or maybe I should double back because I, I probably read it before I knew who you were. So maybe it went, yeah, went yeah. in he, one, he year, co- one year. He, he uses a yeah. code word to describe me. Oh, okay. I'll have to, I'll go back and look for that. Yeah, yeah. Case point, White's a great book, but that is the Brett that people have trouble with. You know, the the cultural critic, the, you know, ceaselessly opinionated person. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. Whereas the shards, I think, represent something that even people who may not agree with a lot of what he says culturally that's the Brett that they like, you know, the the one who casts a very romantic image of the Los Angeles of the 80s and all this stuff. I mean, yes. to me, I, I don't know if you can get, I don't know how you get anyone to read a book anymore, but I do think if there was ever a book of Brett's that could appeal. Really yeah, no, no, for, no, for sure. Yeah. And I think, I think the way he tells the stories in this book is so specific and beautiful to him. And there's like one part, like it's really funny where he's just like, literally writing like I don't care I don't care about like things for like 10 pages and I was just like this is so him like captured like in in an essence and I think that I I mean I love the book I think the cover is so beautiful like um yeah no yeah I I I think yeah I'm really happy that you listened on Patreon to the thing that's really cool yeah I gotta I gotta of course I'm gonna read it in print form because that's a whole different experience oh you'll love it then I'll be able to give my own sort of take on you know where it stands in the pantheon of Brett books, but it doesn't, you know, I, I, as of right now, I would say it's absolutely one of my favorite. For me, books it's here. very hard for me to like process like, like, like the consciousness around like Patrick Bateman, because it's like, it is so huge. Like your brain, my brain almost shuts down. Like, it's like, I can't, I can't understand how he carries that legacy with him every day. Like I, it doesn't commute. It's so big. You know? Oh yeah, I think about that. You know, he created one of the more beloved, not beloved. That's the wrong word. But I mean, how many, how many other novels? And obviously, the some of this is owed to the to the film version. But still, how many other people have written characters in books that are so instantly recognizable to people as Patrick? Bateman? You're gonna yeah. you're gonna literally be so in shock right now. I've actually never seen the movie. I swear oh no! Uh, it's like uh, yeah, there's a lot of movies I haven't seen either. There's so much content. Like yeah, there's so much. There's so it's, much it's a content. Good movie. Yeah, yeah. But, it's yeah. it's very hard um to to figure out like um like and also I I feel like very intuitive about seeing movies. Like it's like a higher consciousness thing. Like I saw The Matrix for the first time in theaters, like the first one last December, and I was like, okay. Yeah. I waited my whole life for the order out of chaos for a pandemic to happen for the matrix to be re-released in theaters to me for to have a theater experience of it for the first time and go to the movies alone and see it and experience it and okay now i have the matrix downloaded and then i saw scream for the first time yeah i actually just saw scream for the first time what do you think of it i like it yeah Um, i think it's smart yeah it's smart um I don't know. I can't separate it from nostalgia. I mean, when I was growing up and we were the same age, so 
maybe two. I remember everyone had that scream mask on Halloween. Yeah. I didn't even know. I was like homeschooled as a kid. I was a little socially isolated. I didn't even yeah. know it was from a movie until I was like 15. That's so pretty cool. Anyway, uh, is Scream a good movie? I mean, it's to me, it's inseparable from from nostalgia for that era. But I mean, I've seen all this. I want to I want to talk yeah. a bit about that for a second. Yeah. Why can the human why are human beings not able to move past the new millennium like why are we as a consciousness so attached to the 1990s and the early 2000s i mean we've never in a culture ever had these devices that can literally give us libraries of these this type of immersive one second nostalgia of oh i can go look at a kd commercial i saw in 2003 this like akashic library of all these these feelings i think what maybe people are grieving is order is 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 literally order is they're feeling okay i miss it's the last when... time we remember there being any order in culture yes I, yes yeah. yes i yes. think that's why i mean there's a lot of different angles you could approach that question from but i think that may be the most clear to me is that you know these things in our pocket our phones our computers social media it's this portal to chaos that we're co- constantly bombarded with and but but like you know, a lot of us were alive in the '90s and 2000s. The last time we remember there being more order with. I, but I I really truly do believe this. If you put the extra conscious effort to to live a more like if if you if you have the privilege to do it to to live a more like AOL lifestyle, like I I have a lot of rules and order around how to use the internet in a very minimal way. I mean, I could share it if you're interested, but uh, yeah, I, I would be interested. I, yeah. I think um, number one thing I would say is, is that you have to think of your mobile devices as uh, desktop, desktop devices. You have to think of them as like windows computers with like hard drives that they're meant to be at home. And that to, when you leave the house, you only need a minimal amount of access, which would be like a flip phone an iPod a discman, something like that. And if you can true, if your life doesn't rely on apps or things like that for like survivalism, you could truly live an off the grid type lifestyle. So I created something that I do every day called AOL hour. Hmm. And basically I changed um, on the iPhone. I changed the background to the, the AOL login, like the screenshot thing. Yeah. And I, and I set a timer for an hour and I just do, I am instant chat, all that type of stuff. And then I leave. The problem is, is we don't leave. We don't log out. Why do they not let us log out? They don't want us to log out. That's why. Absolutely. Yeah, no. um, Well, yeah, I mean, these are all, again, to to, to tie back into the magic conversation, it's order out of chaos. And it's magic. It's neuroassociative conditioning. Yeah. You know, it's, the question is how, well, yeah, because you, you mentioned the two kind of definitions of magic. It's, you know, bending reality in line with your true will. That to me seems almost like the more spiritual dimensions of things. Like, well, what is your true will? How that's, do you access that? I want that? this. That's like, yeah. Your but, but also like, it, it seems like that's the type of thing that would be tied into entities or to pretend, you know, potentially worshiping God, you know, like the, the, the notion of finding that true will. Obviously it's your will, but it's also like. What did you think of the chapter in the book about like creating your own angels? Like, what did you think of that? That one was a little more abstract to me in my experience, but I definitely found it interesting. I haven't really like delved into that myself, um, but. I think it's more so about like, instead of worshiping or looking to the archetypes that already exist create your own archetypes with the qualities of Hmm. of of something and then build a relationship with that like because it's all about a lot of people have you know a very messed up attachment style right so when they start to build um a relationship with an immaterial force they can create more of a secure attachment interesting yeah so yeah, no, that, that's what I, that, so that kind of thing, you know, archetypes and, and creating yeah, your yeah. own angels Tropes. to me, that, that ties more into the, you know, finding, finding your true will or finding like your higher self almost. Um, yeah. But the order out of chaos aspect of it, um, that to me is like the very like practical hands-on, like you don't even necessarily have to think of it as like magic element of things. Um, and that's something that's really spoke have, to me have a lot. You, you've, you've had some success with magic, right? Yeah, um, I, I have, but a lot of it, a lot of it kind of is, is in that sort of latter category of 
you know, having this constant need in my life with the internet, with so much else going on, you know, to create order out of chaos or to find order in chaos. And for me, a lot of the magic that I've delved into, whether it's uh, lighting candles or using sigils, and I, I, you know, I've experimented with a lot of the stuff that you talk about in the book. A yeah. lot of that for me, not that, not that the, not that the notion of true will and all that, that stuff's very important to me. But a lot of it, a lot of my experiences has just simply been, you know, kind of ritualizing my desire. Yeah to yeah. to create order out of chaos Sick. or if I, it's like yeah, I, yeah. it's like i want to stay off of social media for this hour i want to work out right now or focus yeah, on yeah. writing i light a candle first and that beautiful wow focus. so that's so, almost like the 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 bridge into the multiplex of the reality like the the like okay so like think of like a multiplex theater right mm -hmm. there's like multiple different versions of realities you can walk in it's like this seems like the candle is the bridge to let you into that better reality yeah no no definitely and like i you know ritualize this in symbols like carve symbols into candles i arrange candles in certain ways um there's all these things that i enjoy i enjoy the creativity of doing and a lot of it i think boils down for me just simply finding order in chaos um, what do you think of like like um like uh i'm i mean you're probably not a marvel guy which is fine i'm not really <laughs> either i just yeah. like have to um I, I went to some you know really dark spaces during quarantine mm -hmm. and stuff like that I, i've sure. ignored marvel yeah. my entire life i don't even want to talk about it it's but, fine yeah <laughs> but the idea of, of a multiversal quantum consciousness whatever the fuck multi multiversion Multiple versions of reality coexisting at once is not a yeah. Marvel concept. It's from multiple, you know, it's long yeah. time theorists and things like that. Like you have to kind of think about it like, okay, there's the mat at 1 p.m. in reality A. And then there's the mat at 1 p.m. in reality B. There's all these different versions of mat at that 1 p.m. in different realities. Which one yeah. are you going to choose? Yeah. Oh, well, I've never thought of it that way, but I think that'll be helpful. Um, yeah, it's really helpful yeah. to think of that because like I always think of that. I'm like, okay you know there is the 1 p.m version of me that could uh, like in reality a that could you know go on a fucking spiral on the internet or i could go for a walk right now or go to the gym and yeah. feel something more fulfilling no absolutely well let me ask you this because i wouldn't say that i struggle with this but like it's you know something that i um you know still i'm still evolving with regard to this but yes in the, the idea of finding your true will, you know, that's, okay, you know, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. it's, it's difficult. Right. And like order out of chaos, that makes sense to me, but like what? Okay. What, I, I have a good story for this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I think, you know, the true will would, would be the part of you that is your most deepest desire that you feel that you came here to accomplish and, and to achieve. So yeah. for me, like you might be shocked to hear this, but like, you know, I feel like with writing and, and being an author and being an, uh, an artist and all this type, I feel like this was actually something bestowed on me. And there was a part of me no, that's, that was, yeah. that was extremely resistant towards it where I, I would do drugs and try to nest. I was like, no, like what the fuck? Like, why can't I just be like the rest of the hockey boys? Like, why can't I just, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, why yeah. do I have to fucking do all this? Like, this is, this is being handed to me. And as soon as I gave up and I surrendered to the true will and I was like, okay, I'm going to move in accordance with it. Everything started to be synchronistic. So it's really accessing this real life purpose desire. Maybe you don't know it yet, but it is finding it within you and embodying it. I mean, Crowley, no, not Crowley, but um, there's this word praxis, theory and action yeah. into practice, practice, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 the immersion of the will and is such a, a powerful thing. And I think why I appreciate pop stars in a way, in a magical way, is because of the discipline to accomplish their reality of, of showing up every day for the things that they all get done. You know what yeah. I mean? It's very fucking fascinating. I mean, any type of athlete, any master, yeah, you yeah. have the same consciousness as them. Like, why, why are they any better? Like, that's why I say in the book, like why the why same tools that you us? have yeah the, yeah the same tools and this is this is a notion that's always i found inspiring you know the same tools that anyone in history has used yeah. to build anything are accessible Love to us the drama yes. right now the, the the main the main enemy 
Well, I, I, you know, the, the main enemy for me, and I think for a lot of people is just the, the chaos of overstimulation of too many possibilities. And the challenge is finding that true will, finding that true calling. The, yes, yes. What yes. You're, you are meant to do. Now, I, you know, I like that. Some, sometimes I think I it's like more, so, sometimes I think the notion of true will or like a calling in life, sometimes I think it's more of like almost like a useful myth. Like that on my more nihilistic days, it's like, no, we, it doesn't matter what any of us do. Um, but but yeah. even, even on those days, I think we we would do well to look in the mirror and say, you know, in that old that old you know maxim, every day and every way, I'm getting better and better. You know, you look in the mirror, and what I'm trying to say is, even some days, I think there is like a, a metaphysical truth to it. Like we are we are we are all here with like a mission, you know, a calling yes, yes, from God about, or whatever. Yeah. And then other days it's like, well, well, no, actually it all means nothing. But either way, I think it's central to like well-being in life and obviously to any kind of real accomplishment that you find. A catalyst would tell you that. Throw yourself into, you know, oh, he froze up. Their own limitations shoot you froze up for a second there right as i think you were saying something interesting wait am i can you hear me i can hear you now can you hear me wow that's very interesting i said like something kind of yeah juicy, you were saying and then it, then it, it dropped I, I, out. if it's not too much to ask i'd love it if you would say it again um yeah, you, yeah. you, you, you uh, can hear me now sorry about yeah, that what was the last thing you remember hearing you were, you told me you were saying a Kabbalist would tell you, and then it froze. Oh, wow. 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 <laughs> so a Kabbalist would that. tell you that on yeah. the days that you feel those nihilistic lower thoughts, it's the tree of, it's the Citra Archa. It's the other side of the lower, the the, the inverse tree of life, you know, the darker Sephiroth, yeah. um, distracting you and giving you limitations to, to keep you away from your fullest godlike potential. Because Kabbalah is really about being a god on earth. Hmm. Inter oh, wow. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you have, yeah, no, I think in that, that definitely resonates in terms of like the idea of, 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 you know, finding, finding your true will is fine. You know, finding that God, God on earth or however you want to put it, like finding that ultimate purpose that high, yeah. Highest potential living you talk about, you know, living to your highest Supernal. potential. Yeah. But like, um, also like, like, I think like you have to also remember, like, if you've ever even, you know, I mean, if you ever explored like the kind of hateful rants that Brett has read that I've said on about things like on his show or posted about like some of my writing, it's like, don't ever think for a second that I don't have that prone ability to be nihilistic and apathetic and angry yeah. and hateful all day. You know what I mean? It's no. like, I have to, I have to choose every day to not be that person. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And in order, again, we've talked about this, I think it makes enough sense. But how, how do you do that? You do it well, you do it through Kabbalah, but also through that notion of alchemy. Um, a lot yes. of people obviously know alchemy as a medieval, you know, attempt to turn <laughs> yeah. stuff into gold or whatever, create the philosophy. Yeah, stone. But gold. Yeah. We, we are talking about, you know, a psychological alchemy of basically, basically just what, what you, yeah, you know, get turning all that those subconscious slime out subconscious slime lower vibration shadow self stuff and turning it into into light um that was one of the elements of the book that was the most revelatory for me as a writer and as a as a as a creator i mean i i, I view that as the process that I'm yeah always because a lot of people you know really fetishize and lust over their own darkness and building an identity off of their own darkness and i think that's the most boring fucking person ever you know like it's so yeah. exhausting like maybe because when I was younger and depressed, I did that. And it, I see how I was living such a limited claustrophobic, like suffocating life in my own um, attachment to, to my darkness. And I think yeah. that, um, uh, I mean, I'm, tur I'm turning 29 next year. So like I, as you are, you know, I'm going about to hit my Saturn's return, you know, and yeah. hit this point of adulthood and evolution. And I mean, I don't know how how do you like what do you reflect on your 20s like what do you do you like it like what did you think of that shit oh man well i've not i mean i'm i'm actually still 27 i'm turning 28 in a, a couple of months but yeah. I, I do feel like 
my you don't 20s, feel it's over i feel it's over <laughs> uh, i know I, I do i do feel like it's beginning it's so to, over <laughs> to foreclose and i mean my 20s have been hard my 20s have been tough uh they've yeah, been yeah. in many ways tougher than my teenagers i'm a happier more productive blah 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 person than i was when i was a teenager but what i liked about being a teenager was was the sort of narr- the clear narrative arc of it it was like I'm going to be in middle school and then I'm going to be in high school. You provide you the order. A, a absolute or, and go, I went to call it. I don't know if you did, but whatever, like, no. uh, you know, that, that, but that was like a big, like kind of rite of passage thing, you know, try everything. For Were you in a time. fraternity? I was not, I was in a cooperative <laughs> house, but nevertheless, like, um, you know, there's, um, there's all kinds of like very uh, pretty normal, you know, um, development as a teenager in terms of what I was doing at what age. Yeah totally normal 20s and then the t- your 20s is like you're facing all of this existential um chaos and also navigating but also there's also a huge sense of grief that you know as an artist and as a writer and all this series that there's not really an arena anymore to accommodate your skill and your gift yeah, and uh, i so think that's really hard for people to accept d- absolutely so you know my 20s have been tough because it's been this huge blank slate of figuring out my life. None of, you know, there's been so obviously I, I think I've evolved plenty and a lot in yeah. my, in my twenties, but, but in a way that was much more coming from me, which should be a good thing, but it was, you know, it's, it's, it's much more like, okay, what am I, what am I doing? And like, oh, so you feel like you initiated the growth. Yeah. If, it, 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 so if when I was a teenager and in fact, I was, you know, there was times when I was a younger teenager where I w- was, you know, very rebellious. I, I told my parents, I didn't want to go to college at a certain point, you know, like mm-hmm. I, 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 it, my life, I was not in control of my life. It was being guided along on this path of like a very yeah. like typical evolution. Whereas in my twenties, I do think I've evolved, but it's all been so much more harder fought because it's all, you know, I could have just dropped out of life out of college and and you so kind of feel that feeling, feeling like you're stuck you're stuck with matt like you know who you are in a weird way like yeah, you no, like you can't de- resist him anymore de- definitely that and i mean you you mentioned it too like it, the as someone with a calling as as a writer and as a cultural commentator whatever there i never really felt you know i never i i, always, I wanted to do that after college but there was no like easy outlet or job that no it's not I like, like what gen x and like early millennials got because yeah. they all had an arena like you go on you know, like you write a book, you go on MTV, you fucking hit the New York Times bestseller list because everyone's watching, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't work like that anymore. And I think that um, even the, like, like, I, like, I don't know if you've ever noticed, but I've always played with the ideas of like fame and celebrity as like an artist, like a, like a painting palette, like to fuck with, like to show people how meaningless it is. Like, you know, there could be a girl from Minnesota with like, 700,000 followers who checks her phone every day and she feels like she's this famous star, but you walk on the street and no one knows who she is. So fame and celebrity are, are um, dead concepts. They are. No, dead. things have changed a lot. And they, that's kind of ties a little bit into what we're talking about with, you know, being, being a younger millennial and the cultural brick wall, the twin yeah. cultural brick walls of Trump into COVID. Um, no, we, you know, older, millenn- I don't know if I already said this on the pod, but like, Older, older millennials, many of them graduated college in like 2008. They, they graduated in this horrible, you know, downturn economy. And had a, yeah, they had a hard time finding jobs, which sucks. I, you know, didn't graduate into such a bad economy, but I did graduate into a total cultural depression. And I think cultural that depression and also no, there's, there's no, there isn't an arena of culture, like in yeah. a way, pop culture doesn't exist. It, it, it totally in a way. And I, I live in LA, I work here. Like I, I've kind of worked adjacent to pop culture, but like without that passion for it, because it's mm-hmm. not necessarily, you know what I mean? It's been this weird thing, but you know, I have podcasts and I, I write, yeah, I, you know, but I, I think like, I think yeah. like one of, you know, what to, from an optimistic, like Jupiter kind of point of view of like yeah. what you could do and what you'll continue to do is you just kind of have to build your own space and, you know, let, let, you know, your work be passed around and the people who are meant to find it, find it, you know, and, and that's just kind of how it, how it is now. And I think how I feel about it now versus when I was younger, where it was more about achieving to prove something and to, to receive my worth through external validation and approval and building an image. Now it's more about, okay, well, you know, what actually matters is self-mastery of the craft and impacting people. And if I yeah. can get those two things going, that's what matters the most. I don't really give a fuck anymore about like, 
I mean, I think when like Madonna reads your book, like that's the peak uh, for yeah. that type of validation. It's like, there you I go. Agree. Like yeah. the, the validation meter broke. Yeah. Well, no, I think that, that those are inspiring words. I mean, I think that the type of fame whatever you want to call it that you have um, is really very uh, aspirational for someone like me. I mean, I think that you, you, what you describe, you know, putting the work out there and having the right people find it at the right time is the most we can hope for. None of us are going to be Brett Easton Ellis in the eighties published. That's, you know, and when I was in college, I, I always had this fan. I, I, I admit, like I, I was a big Brett fan and I always had this fantasy that I knew was bullshit, but I nevertheless had the fantasy of, cause I was, you know, doing creative writing stuff. I had the yeah. fantasy of, you know, I'm going to write a novel and it's going to, you know, I'm going to get it published at like 22, like Brett did. And it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. It's not, I mean, a, whether or not, whether or not I actually had the talent for that is one thing, but even if I had, it wouldn't have happened, you know? And yeah. I mean, it, it could have better, happened, but it might have not have been what your work was going to be at 28 or 27. I mean, like, like, I think like, I think less than zero is very beautiful, but it, it is, is very yeah. much a teenager writing a book and it's yeah. very much, uh, though it's well edited and, and stuff like that. Um, I, I do think that, yeah, I think a lot of, of people, people had those things and, you know, it, it's really about um, you know, bending those dreams to fit the econ- the attention economy of now mm-hmm. and how you're going to build yourself in today's world, you know, because Brett's, you know, literati 80s shit is, it's not even worth talking about because it's so fucking far gone. It's like, it's, it's like, it's, a, it's just like, it's a dinosaur. It's like, so it's like extraterrestrial. It's like not even if impossible in today's world. But, I um, think it is. I think it is impossible. I mean, yeah, like it, there, there's no there's no book like people don't read. But, you know, as a writer, like people aren't reading books in that way anymore. So, it, so you have to you have to kind of recalibrate. Yeah. So you have to you have to kind of like yeah. appreciate like putting out books into the world and, and feeling OK, you know, if if people read them. I mean, you know, like book talk. Right. You know, people yeah. on TikTok there, there's the whole like YouTube book, book community and all that type of stuff, but it's not a cultural impact thing. You still have to be plugged into a particular alg- algorithm to know what's happening. Yeah, no, definitely. It's not like, it's not like um, the trailer for, or I don't know, like, like a Brett interview comes on after a Britney Spears interview, you know what I mean? And then yeah. everyone sees it all in one hit. And then they go, oh, cool. I'm going to go buy that book. It's like, that doesn't exist anymore. The way that I had to promote pop magic and the way that I had to really like exert myself is I had to feel like, okay, how can I be a media virus and infect as many algorithms and people as possible? See, yeah, that's what I mean about like, you, you know, you have this great ability to sort of get in, get out with the digital economy of things. Like it's, it's, it's very aspirational to know how to hack that a little bit, you know? Yeah, for sure. Um, and but I, I think, I, I, yeah, but I don't, I don't think you should sell yourself short. I do think that, you know, you could, anyone could really make a, a, a cultural or a, a literary impact on, on people or on a sect of people or anything like that. I mean, look, Mike Maud did it, right. you know, yeah. even though it's like all like right wing crazy people, but like, it's, it's, he still did it. You know what I mean? Yeah. And um, I mean, I wouldn't, compare what he's done to like Americans. I'm not going to give him that ego boost, you know, at all. But I think like what he did is, is that he infected a certain algorithm and he created um, a book and a template for an algorithm and it worked out for him. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know, I think just slowly over time, I'm kind of, you know, I, I, you asked me about my twenties, which I appreciate because I think it's an interesting topic, you know, the difference between the twenties and your teens and, and, you know, my experience as it, you know, we have this in common since you were born the same year as, as the twenties kind of come to a close. It's, it's, it's interesting. And I think that the 20, my twenties for me, as someone who has cultural aspirations has been this process of like learning all, all of what we're talking about right now in terms of, you know, how, how to find an audience, what kind of audience is even desirable and and how to kind of. No, and it is really hard to yeah. like activate a will to be seen or to want attention in this type of world. It's like, what's the fucking point? It's like, you wake up, and you're like throwing a penny into like a, a, I don't know, like a water fountain that is just like evaporating and sucking it all away. It's like, it's, I get it. And I get why people are frustrated. And like, dude, like I think of my young musician friends and I'm like, how, I even talked about this with Diplo the other day. I was like, how the fuck are they going to blow up? Like, how are they going to go viral? Yeah. Like there's no opportunity. Like 
maybe Little Peep was probably, or Billie Eilish, maybe these were like the last, I mean, I'm seeing it with Ethel Kane a little bit, but even then it's like- yeah, no, it's but, crazy. I would never yeah. thought I would say, but you're right, Billie, even Billie Eilish seems a little bit like- That's what Diplo on said. Era now, which is insane. That's what Diplo yeah. said. He was like, she's gone now. She is, and there's no, but, but it's not as if she was replaced either. It's not even like the Andy Warhol 15 Minutes of Fame thing. It's like, now there's not even- that <laughs> you know no, what I mean it's no. just so so disparate but you know what I think if there's any silver lining to this Alex I think it's that people now that things are so disparate and 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 basically no one's guaranteed an audience the art yeah. that you have to make you have to make the art that you have to make there's there's no that, there's yeah no, that, that's exactly it um clout chase well you can still chase clout obviously I'm not saying things are like perfect now it's not some utopia of equality but like and you really like you're not going to be there's no there's no there's less anyway and increasingly perhaps no no you know trends to chase like you have to make the work that speaks most and, directly and, to and, your and, soul and, and that will speak as long to as you people, want so. to make yeah. the work that that is of quality because once it's out there it's out there and i think that's the thing that you said it's like one of the silver linings for artists today is put good fucking work out and and take your and, and take your time on it i mean that that's that's pretty much it i mean like because what is what is the point at that point because it's like there's not really i mean even music albums has dropped in quality because people just want to compete yeah. with like the their their competitors i mean i'm in i'm interested to see this new taylor swift album next week with the jack antonoff production and all that oh definitely yeah yeah so there's I'm, still there's still like threads of interesting stuff from a slightly more orderly era you know that we still but kind of they're all back they're through. all they're all like this like like they're they're this like charmed blessed bunch who 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 all you know perfect timing that you know kind of people born in the early 90s kind of missed is is that they all got that opportunity to build their audience when there was still an arena you know and yeah I'm, no. I'm happy that you're you're kind of bitter about this because i'm definitely bitter about it too oh yeah it's made everything like about 50 times a billion times harder oh, de- oh definitely i mean yeah even even brett you know like he is lucky I, i'm not yeah i think he's aware of this but you know that he has that sort of grandfathered in audience to to buy a book like the shards someone you know that you couldn't really like come up in i that mean same i think now. that's yeah. what social media really should should have been for i mean are kind of like the already established people i mean i like the idea of establishing yourself on social media but like yeah brett having a social media page kind of makes sense to me because it's like you're already you know a thing you know but i do yeah. i like the idea of coming like i like the idea of i mean of course i i've used the internet in the same way charlie xcx has or anyone else to like get their career going and anyone else like i i I owe it all to it, but um, I find that, I don't know, like with the Gen Zers, like their, their branding and, and their self-gazing and narcissism is, and it's so, it's so just to be looked at, you know, like the TikTok kind of narcissism is like really yeah. what Brett was discussing in Glamorama, like 20, well, I mean, a million years ago. Yeah, no, definitely. And it's, you know, it's, it's hard to know kind of what, what's going to happen next culturally. It's yeah. It, it, right now, everything seems so chaotic. Um, I have, a, I think I have like an idea. I think like mainstream culture is going to continue to reference like about like 2006, 2007 stuff. Like we're going to probably depart from the late nineties, early two thousands obsession. And then we're going to go into like a 2006 to 2012 kind of fetish. Yeah. And then from there, we'll go into like the 2013, 1975 Tumblr girl era obsession. And that will be mirrored back in pop culture and like things like that. It's all going to be a endless, recycle, endless a recycle. recycling. Yeah. So that, but that's, Which I is mean, devastating. Yeah, it's, it is devastating. You know, I mean, what would be, if this isn't too abstract or hard of a question uh, and, you know, you are a pop artist and you, you know, you are involved in this. So I think your opinion really counts for something here. Like what, is there anything more optimistic, optimistic you see going on culturally that you have hope for? I mean, I guess like space spaces like, like this that are so yeah. like, you know, um, pretty much like celebrating, challenging and, 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 uh, interrogating the consensus of, of kind of everything and, and looking at it from an objective point of view. I think more people need that. Yeah. Uh, I guess there are some musicians that are exciting, but I think when it like, uh, what, what's like a good last recent movie you've ever seen? 
I mean, there's been some okay ones this year, but just nothing that really, you know, like uh, Ty West's two movies from this year, both X and Pearl. I don't know. I'm just thinking of examples here. I haven't here. seen those. Did you see the they're, they're fine, one that but, all the hipsters are talking about? The sadness uh, one or uh, whatever? Everything, everywhere, all at once. No, no, no. 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 <laughs> it's like the triangle of big sad. I don't fucking know. Oh, yeah. Know. I think there's a movie called Triangle of Sadness. I actually know very little about that movie. Yeah. So it's like a, it's like a, about like wealthy people and it has like Woody Harrelson and and stuff like that. I mean, I'm probably you're probably feel like I do. Like I have fucking decades to catch up on of content. Yeah, no, you know what I, I mean? Do. It's like I can't yeah. even really consume anything new unless it's really utilitating because it's like I have literal like decades to catch up on of things I know that I... will inform me in a positive way. Yeah, no, definitely. So there's not any you're not like necessarily watching any tv shows right now that are like um, i mean i think there's some decent tv out there but it's like yeah yeah brightler really like likes tv stuff he was talking about Dahmer to me i'm not gonna watch that yeah I, I watched it i you know it's all this i have a lot of positive things i could say about it it's it's but it's not like nothing okay let me put it this way i think there's plenty of good tv coming out i think there's plenty of good movies or there's at least some good movies coming out there's even good books coming out like brett's but there's just nothing that feels like this is the thing now well, there, there's it's going nothing to catapult that feels us like into the, the future of a yeah. cultural moment anymore because there is no culture to have a moment yeah. anymore like we all felt um even when we were kids even though we weren't old enough to process that scream was out and all this type of stuff we still felt in a cellular way a cultural feeling of, exactly. of, of a collective camaraderie and i think yeah um this unity around culture is completely gone completely gone definitely that's that's and that's i think kind of one of the the one of the sadnesses of our time i mean you're definitely right with scream again i didn't even know it was a movie but just the pro the the proliferation of those halloween masks uh, you know yeah. from the movie like it captured that moment so now i look back and it's like it was this common thing that i'm nostalgic for yeah um you know, I think that there's there are equivalents to that kind of common culture with something like Dahmer with because Netflix. Um, but even with Netflix, like a lot of these things come out on the streaming services and you ask someone like, I have no idea what the fuck you're talking about, because there's no way to promote everything on one arena. Yeah, well, I, I agree. There's there's plenty of stuff that, you know, it, there's so much stuff that you never even heard of. Like, I, you know, I keep up with TV, but like there's still plenty of stuff that I've never even heard of. But my point with Netflix is they and someone actually framed it this way. I think it actually might've been on Brett's podcast and it really kind of, and this corresponds a little bit with some of the stuff we're talking about with the internet and possibly in a negative light, but you know, Netflix dumps stuff into people's houses like that. You know what I mean? Like everyone, like most people have oh, Netflix that's interesting. and they yeah. just like, it's, it's like, it's like when you two made that album that got put in everyone's eyes. <laughs> that in like, was 2014. So like that's what, yeah, it was, it was horrifying. And that's what Netflix does with all content. So to the extent that there are still like this water cooler, there is still this water cooler common culture conversation. And again, I agree. It's not quite what it once was, but the closest thing that the, the, the closest equivalent are Netflix shows. It was. So do you, do you I, have a, I have a good comment yeah. about this. Do you know the movie do revenge? No. Okay. So it's a, it's a new um, Netflix produced a uh, coming of age uh, film that is stylized as like late nineties, uh, like uh, movies like yeah. jawbreaker you know 10 things i hate about you cruel intentions um like yeah. you know and also like uh 80s movies like heathers and stuff like that and yeah. you'd think that you know you you're reading all this press on like vogue vanity fair all the like it's uh, maya hawks and it's like a big cast all this type of stuff you think that this would like impact the generation that it's it's trying to reach gen z right i've mm -hmm. asked like five gen zers if they know what this movie is, they have no fucking idea. But you go on oh. the internet and it seems like this is like the, the mean girls of their generation. No, I think it's that not really impacting them. The, the, the gr great example. I think that Hollywood and the entertainment industry and just the whole legacy media and press and whatever and entertainment industry has a real Gen Z problem on its hands. They don't know how to appeal to them. Yeah. Like uh, and they, they don't even know how to get, get their time or attention. How do no, you find so, them? I, I I haven't looked at the numbers, but I would really gather that a lot. Well, I know this is the case for, I mean, this is very clearly the case for, for, for legacy news and newspapers. I mean, it's really only like boomers that are reading that. And then you go down the, the list a little bit, like, you know, when it comes to like Netflix and Hulu and stuff, I'm sure it's mostly like millennials and up. And I think that as also, Gen Z becomes, like, I don't use, yeah. I don't use streaming services. I still watch VHS and DVDs and go to like uh -huh. video stores because yeah. it's like the only way that I can like process the, right. the feeling of like engaging with a film. 
and um also just the idea of like the fucking feeling of the streaming services and how they don't want you to make a decision like they just want yeah. you to keep oh, being yeah. in a process of scrolling and looking like so you don't make a decision so you keep using the app like it's truly evil and psychotic like i think like that's a big problem that i have with the streaming services like you'll be with friends and they'll be like oh yo like let's go on netflix and like it's two hours of not choosing a movie yeah no no i've I've always netflix is the worst about this the way they have you know they actually have the thing start playing while you're oh it's so aggressive very aggressive aggressive. yeah no i mean i think if if you're not using streaming services similar it's the equivalent of you know not using social media you know more more power to you because again these things end up being what do you even think of the music music streaming services like do you feel like your your relationship with music has changed because of Uh, spotify yes yes and no so i resisted using spotify for very many years cool, and I would cool. still I buy that. you know buy buy physical music download music more recently i've gotten back on spotify i go back and forth i can't make up my mind i do find spotify it is like if i want to really keep up it or like find more new music it's very yeah. helpful to have it but then it's like is that actually does it even matter if i'm listening to new stuff or can i just listen to the old stuff over and over again. Uh, yeah, I have yeah. a comp- complicated relationship with it. Um, I, I definitely resisted having the streaming services for a while, but more recently I've kind of, um, what's the word? Submitted to their... Yeah, I think it yeah. could be interesting to kind of like, as like a last <clears throat> FM thing, like kind of like organizing like a library or like feeling what you want to get. Like, but I find I've recently been like renting CDs from the library and like, it's been very satisfying to like, oh shit, like this is a work of art that I need to like sit down and experience from start to finish. No, that's you know definitely I mean? the better way to, to stay focused. And on that's it. how you can get into those positive uh, flow states and all that type of stuff that they don't, the, they, you know, that's uh, like Tarantino, like the simulation, like doesn't want us in. Yeah. Um, you know, ironically or not ironic. Well, yeah, actually I would say ironically, given what he's all about, it was kind of Mike Ma. He has like, um, along with his books, he has something, he has like a massive Spotify playlist that's just like public. And I got, well, again, while I was going through that phase of like, you know, doing a deep dive into his work, I was listening to his playlist a lot, which is fantastic. It's like exactly the kind of music that I like, you know, it's basically indie rock from a certain period of time mixed with like like John Mouse and shit. Yeah, all that great stuff. So like, I, I was listening a lot to that and it kind of made me get back into streaming service because I actually, contra- earlier in life, I've been really resistant to playlists. I thought that sort of put everything into a blender in a way I didn't like. But as I've gotten older, as I've actually slowed down on, you know, listening to to music that's coming out, the idea of having like a big retrospective playlist that I could just cycle through yeah. has has gained more appeal to me um a long story short i think there's pitfalls with spotify as there are with all these other you know internet based portals to chaos that we described but I, more recently i've come into a better relationship with spotify where i feel that i can actually use it to cultivate what i'm listening to in, in a more yeah no i, I think i think way. it's like i think it's like kind of like a little bit of uh in a chamber amongst you know the 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 digital world like like, I think like it, it can be nice for like history, like good research, like, oh, okay, you know, maybe I'll uh, like, but I find it's a lot of <clears> hoarding. <throat> it's like, oh, I'll listen to that microphones album one day, but I don't have time right now. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. it's like saving a lot of, a lot of like things, but yeah, I don't know. I think um, I would really, I, I, I've, what I've kind of realized, like after writing pop magic and doing the, the press and like kind of being an advocate mm-hmm. for all this type of stuff is like most people don't really want to live outside of the simulation like people want to stay in it yeah no no that's i, I think you're right and we're kind of it's more comfortable it's more it's more comfortable and it's conditioned uh by the powers that be or whomever uh t- to be that way i'm gonna ask a question about that in a second but i guess my final thought on sort of spotify t- yeah t- it, it, we're talking about something kind of well, like, wait, Concrete, like you know about but, the concept yeah. of like curation is not creation, right? Yeah. No, absolutely, yeah. Well, I mean, I mean, I guess to go back to Tumblr, that maybe exactly kind of seems like the Tumblr thing was was the 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 place where the notion of you can be a curator rather than a creator was yeah, first sort of so fucking weird. And uh, yeah, no, it's 
it, 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 curation is another one of those kind of like negative placeholders for something greater, which is creation. Yeah. Well, um, yeah. What were you yeah so I think that's, that's worth considering. Uh, we're talking about something kind of concrete and, and, you know, almost banal in the way of like, you, how do you listen to your music? But I think as with, you know, we're talking about Manson earlier in his career, how it kind of ties into these more fundamental, magical, esoteric, spiritual concepts, you know, the, the struggle is like, chaos is negative and, and kind of going to these portals of chaos is negative, but also creativity is a kind of dance between order and chaos, right? Like it's, yeah, you, York, you, you, you need, always you, talks about that. Yeah. You need the chaos to apply order too. So one way in which I've cautiously got back into using Spotify and I go, this is a very highfalutin way of talking about a music streaming service, but nevertheless, it's like, yes, it is a chaos of all music. Well, except Neil Young and Joni Mitchell now, but yeah, all music for all time. Joni Mitchell's is off now. Oh, that's a whole. Yeah, they they went off because of uh, Joe Rogan. Did you hear about that? Oh no! Wow. So I oh, can't well, listen to Joni Mitchell. Shit. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a whole other topic. But basically, there's there's all you know all this music for all time at your fingertips. That's a very chaotic thing because you don't know. You know, there's all these possibilities, and you have to find like what you actually want to listen to, right? Yeah. But I get I've gotten more used to the idea of using Spotify to to sort of create, you know, making your own playlist, you know, to find that order within, you know, the broad category of all music ever. I, I guess that's how I would describe the kind of more positive. Oh, no, there's some from hanging out with yeah. Gen Zers. I've sort of realized that there's this weird um, beauty sometimes in the vortexes and Absolutely. In, the, in the spirals because you just can stumble upon divine gold. And absolutely it, and it's uh, a know, real thing the, the vortex of current culture the the chaos the swirling chaos of of of, of the internet and all these things we're talking about we're talking about them in a negative light but like um what was going to say these things are chaos is like a wonderful tool but a terrible master is what i would say yeah yeah you know what i mean like you we do need chaos and, and and you know we, we need all of these possibilities and 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 all of them together all at once can be this incredible vortex but you, you can't get sucked into it you have to stand outside of it and utilize it which again i think is like yeah, someone it's, like it's you like a with, remote viewing point of view yeah and someone like you kind of stepping back from social media but also being engaged with the culture is a really, really yeah like i have to i have to that. like even yeah. sometimes i literally go on google images and i look up like vortex gif and i feel like register this is what it is this is what it is you're just going in that you're jumping this is a few the internet in a way is a location you're going somewhere this is oh, this absolutely. is travel this is astral travel this is a ufo this is not this is serious business and it's like how do you want to go into this place yeah and i think if you can get around if you can get your head around that then you've taken one step towards you know as jordan peterson i totally say, empathize the antidote with, to its chaos yeah i totally empathize with the way that people felt in 1999 about the internet like god like the possibilities of i get to go to mtv.com and read a bjork interview instead of in a rolling stone or oh my god i get i mean i think one of i think reddit is uh is the essential bare bones of like the bulletin board system yeah. like message board internet and i think that there's a charming aspect of of that um whether you know i mean i know a lot of people can get addicted to reddit but i think the reddit is very actually early internet and i think yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. the values if we can consciously bring a lot of the positive early values of the internet into our lives like logging off like seeing the internet as a separate place and not a place to be constantly obsessed with. I mean, it's fucking weird to think about. It's like we're becoming like those arcade kids who like sat at the arcade playing Street Fighter for 10 hours. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. I mean, it it, tie, it, wrap, it ties into a lot of things we've talked about. You know, we have to stand, if we're able to stand outside of, you know, the spinning wheel of the Netflix shows, which all want to pull us in. If we're able to stand outside the simulacrum and use the information and tools at our fingertips, uh, we can accomplish wonderful, wonderful things and move the culture forward. But if we get sucked in, it's going to be more, more nihilism, more passivity. I mean, I think that is the cultural yeah, and, predicament and I think, as I understand it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean like we're alive in the fucking 2020s. Like this is not a fun time. Like you, no, we have yeah. to acknowledge that, you know, this is 
it's not a joke like this is an apocalyptic state you know what i mean so like put on your fucking leather trench coat and and get to work you know what i mean like we have to figure it out like we've been dealt this really shitty card and we have to survive it we can't give up like i think what like for me the biggest kind of thing like to tie off is like you know this is kind of you'll probably relate in a weird way to this or kind Mm -hmm. of put yourself in my shoes but here i am like you know writing many manuscripts for many years and here I'm like 20, 25 and I'm, I'm going to be able to buy a book for the first time at, at a bookstore, you know, that is yeah. mine and it's a big yeah. moment. And then three days later, the pandemic starts and everything yeah, goes right. to halt. Right. So it's yeah. like, I wrote this book about showing up to tragedy and, and being strong and all of this type of stuff, all of my routine, all of my comfort. Uh, now I have a huge irrational fear of this fucking pandemic. It's like, all of this yeah. is literally a platter and I have to show up now for the book I wrote. I found it to be the strangest irony. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I think, yeah, I can't imagine you, you published it like days before the pandemic you're saying, right? Yeah. 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 Did that feel that, that probably felt, I mean, shitty for one thing, but almost like, you know, like this dramatic buckle up and use your own words. Like, you know what I mean? I was just yeah. in shock. I was like, Oh my God, like people actually need now tools in the occult more than ever yeah no i agree and again i found your book during the pandemic you know it, it definitely and i you know to, to, i kind of re- like that you yeah. that, that that you you found it through mike because um i do see us being like a light and dark polarity of, of a similar energy or yeah. something that's you know absolutely I mean? that's a hundred percent as i've always you know viewed both of you you know my, my own way of viewing you both in archetypal type of ways um that that's been my you mentioned like how, how I was kind of mystified by, by finding your name in the book. Absolutely. I was, it was a very sort of magical beginning to this whole thing of, of reading him and reading you. And um, yeah, I definitely see it as a kind of light and dark polarity and, and both of you, I think have, have influenced me and both. Yeah, of it would be represent... interesting if, if the two of us were to like combine or collaborate at some point, what would happen? Yeah, no, I I'm curious. I will send Mike this pod and we'll see. He, you know, he also kind of dips in and out of social media. So I don't know if we'll see it, but who knows? Maybe, maybe it was. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to yeah. talk to him again. Like he, he has yeah. to understand that I'm not ignoring him at all. Like I, yeah. I, I'm just restricting the delayed gratification of when, when I want to reach out. No, definitely. Uh, e- either way, I think like um, the, the type of what, what he's achieved and what you've achieved is like what I would hope to achieve, you know, in the, in the, you're doing years it. To come. Why don't you just keep doing it? You know, yeah. you're, on the, you're on the path and you're, you're on your you're on your way and you know um i think um the i think you have to also remember like my 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 really cool friend he his, he he produced like some of madonna's best work like ray mm-hmm. of light no not really like music american life some songs of confession he's very cool Mirawaz, he's a big yeah, french producer him, yeah. he's very amazing um he has this theory about like zero views zero streams that the things that you know no one is really watching the things that people aren't really consuming. These are the things that we need to be consuming because of what is popular is so low content and low quality. I mean, have you ever thought of, you know, like committing to narcissism and like translating your message to the algorithms and TikTok and things like that? Like, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I've thought about starting a TikTok. <laughs> I don't know if I'm cut out for it, but I've, I've considered it. But then on the other, it's like, is that is the step to go further into the storm or to step further back or like something? I mean, I think it would be interesting as an experiment to see because aren't there like, you know, that like the, the people talk about this type of shit on, on TikTok and, and, and the things that you value. So it'd be interesting to see how, if you infected the algorithms a little bit, who what, what would happen with the Lotto 649? Like you might as well try it to see what happens yeah. no i was i was thinking about kind of delving in the whole tiktok astrology scene in my own way or i don't know i watch well i, I don't want to i don't want to speak about projects that i haven't started or that you know i may, yeah, or may do not, not ever do, do. That. no 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 so no. i i'm not Keep i may silent. even cut cut a little bit of what i just said out because i think yeah i, I <laughs> take a cue from you you cut you know you you don't you don't speak but i i have definitely thought about um starting a tiktok presence and talking about some of these ideas there uh, yeah, and, it, and it, I definitely it, will be really cool. Yeah, I'll definitely be. Do you like meme analysis? That. What is that? Is that on He's TikTok? This guy, Chris Gabriel. He's really cool. He's I've heard of, of him. Like yeah. what you're doing. Um, I'll, yeah, I'll look more into it. Yeah. Yeah, he's a YouTube account, meme analysis, and like uh, he's he's uh sort of um been able to like infiltrate the scenes a little bit 
Um, he's a guy who read Pop Magic as well. So he's he's an interest. He's a Saj like you too. So like an oh. interesting mirror. Template. I'll check him out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, well, there will definitely be more work coming from me, and I'm sure Alex the same can be said of you. But I know you don't <laughs> yeah. like to talk about it. Um, zip, you, zip. Yeah. Nope, I've been doing nothing for a pandemic. <laughs> There's well, nothing. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing. I'm just yeah. honestly. Uh, do Do you watch any sports? Mm, when my brothers have it on at home, when I'm visiting, do they watch uh, basketball? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. What are their favorite teams? Uh, so they they live in Philadelphia, so well. Oh, I don't like the 76ers. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, what's your team? Um, I really like uh, the Atlanta Hawks. I really like Trey Young. Um, I think um for me, uh, in a weird fucked up way, there was all these weird synchronicities that led me to watching um sports and NBA in quarantine and in the pandemic, and really um sort of uh feeling a a immersion of will through seeing these young athletes and their work yeah. ethic and, and their, their uh, power evolving and, and, and kind of like, cause I talk about hyper sigils in the book and I truly do believe that. I think when you uh, affinity yourself with a certain archetype or trope or energy, your life will start to mirror certain things about, about that person. So I found a lot of good archetypes for myself through basketball. Yeah. You know what? I've always, um, I don't watch it so much anymore, but I I historically have been a a big fan of the NBA. And I think, uh, you know, absolutely professional sports are are magical in this way too, involving uh, maybe the NBA more so than any other involving, you know, these kind of archetypes and these kind of figures and young athletes, you know, the, the, the logos are are like sigils in their own way. Yeah, no, no, definitely. Um, what do you think of like uh, the warrior, the Golden State Warriors? <laughs> well, uh, the I, I don't, I don't like Steph Curry that much. I mean, I don't like, oh, really? I don't like Golden State. I like, um, I was rooting for the Nets. I like the Chicago Bulls. I like Vucevic. Um, I mean, also, you know, the trades is also a big metaphor too, because as someone who's so attached to like comfort in my life yeah. and like I hate change, like getting to see that form of like change of like a person switching teams is like, oh shit. You know what I mean? Like yeah, that's like no. a big thing in life. Absolutely. I mean, again, this ties into the, the broader picture we're painting here. Like, yes, movies and art are hugely relevant to what ends up constituting like culture and the common culture. Uh, sports are also a huge part of that. I was thinking about this because not basketball, but I, I was um I was actually home this past weekend in Philadelphia and my, my family was watching the Phillies, uh, you know, like in the whatever the playoffs. And I was just thinking like, I'm not like the biggest sports guy, but like this, this stuff, like the teams that are doing well, the players that are on the teams who ends up winning the world series, who ends up winning the NBA championship, what have you. These are all like really important markers of time. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, they, I, and it's I, I very know. And, primal and it's very, it's very about like, you could see yourself as like, Oh, okay. Like, you know, if that guy went from getting scouted at college to the fucking NBA, then what can I do? You know what I mean? Like if you believe, if you really believe in yourself like that about your own work and getting yourself out there and you, and you do, but like I said, I can see how someone like you who feels more of like kind of humble channel or just like moving with the energy and kind of be like, well, I don't even know if this is, you know, kind of like not self-doubting, but like sort of like a humble about what you've been given and what you want to give is like it can be harder to commit to that kind of egoic narcissism to achieve something no definitely but yeah it's interesting you brought up sports because i I definitely think you know a lot of people would differentiate like oh sports are for like the you know the the meatheads or whatever but like no it's it's part and parcel of i mean camille paulia thinks that like watching sports is like poetry in motion definitely no no it's 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 worthwhile yeah, like definitely like ball movement. Yeah. Can be really and, and basket, maybe gorgeous. basketball more, more than anything. Um, yeah, no. I mean, like I've watched football before. Like I'm not a big hockey guy. Like I I think I like how fast basketball is. I like how and it's just about how, war and competition and it's yeah. very in the moment. And just so, and the players are, you know, in football, they're all like clothed up and yeah. in, the, in hockey too, you know, in basketball, it's like, you know, the archetypes are there to be, yeah. to be admired. And so I think it, that's, it's always been the most, Oh yeah, 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 for yeah. sure, for sure. So you live in LA? I do live in LA, yeah. <laughs> I think it's really interesting that I've never like it's sort of funny, huh? Like how I could have totally gone to LA or New York and like really rub shoulders with these people all the time and like be in all of it all the time. And yet 
there's a part of me that completely detests that. Yeah, well, there there is that sort of um, ambivalence, I think, in your work. But I think it's one of the things that's kept you strong is, again, to, you know, kind of being... Be, be, being part of main, you know, pop culture, in, interacting with pop culture while not, but being also it. watching it. Yeah, unfold. I think I think that's kind of central to your mythos and to like the strength of a lot of your work. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I definitely, I definitely need. To, I'm yeah, I'm definitely going to continue to go down that path. Yeah, for sure. So we talked a little bit earlier about cancel culture and yes. the sort of simulacrum and how some people get very sucked into the simulacrum and, and there seems to be, you know, forces in society which would which want people to stay in the simulacrum and then other people kind of go against that and end up getting canceled, obviously. Interestingly, a lot, you know, I mentioned those like names earlier, Brett, Ariel Pink, Marilyn Manson, Camille Paglia, like all of them have, for, uh, we talked about with Manson, but, you know, for, for different reasons have all kind of found themselves on the skids with sort of, they've all found themselves canceled or otherwise called oh, out. yeah. Um, and I know that you're not just another, obviously you're not just another one of these like Jordan Petersonian sort of like no, 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 right wing no, people, no. but at the same time, you're obviously kind of, out, um, you're, you're not exactly part of like the, the liberal mainstream either. So no, I guess no, my, I'm on the outskirts for sure. Um, yeah. And you I, talked about in the Milo pod, you've always kind of identified the sort of cultural libertarianism. Yeah. Out, just like, I care about, know. I care about like, you know, I think, I think like in the point of like, a political point of view i don't really have one but i think in a cultural point of view i do i do want people to be disruptors and and to and to uh I, but i don't believe in empty provocation like i think right. there needs to be value and and if your art is provocative and you're pushing to show a mirror of an aspect of society that people don't want to look at or you have a, a a purpose or a value and you have nuance i really appreciate that in the point of provocation if you're just like talking to Alex Jones to be a troll and like yeah. you need attention and you're a narcissist that really does nothing for me and it does nothing for culture. So yeah. I think like, I think um, what I would say is, is that um, a lot of the problem with the cultural war in the 2020s is a lot of it is fictitious and simulated because there is no real culture being affected outside of it. You know what yeah. I mean? It's Definitely. just living yeah. in an algorithmic uh, arena, like, um, like Pokemon stadium or something, you know what I mean? It's like, just like you're living in this like debate yeah. war algorithm. And I think, um, I don't know. I, I, I think the way that I feel about all of that is, yeah, I do think, I mean, Brett always says to me, you need to get canceled. You need to get canceled. I'm like, no, I really don't. Because if I do end up getting canceled, I want it to be a, from me being artistically true to myself and, um, if people are upset about that, then they're upset about it. And then I get canceled, but I don't want to court being canceled at all. Yeah, I know. I think that the line that you're drawing between, you know, provocation for provocation's sake and provocation for the sake of truth telling and breaking with the simulacrum. Truth telling. Yeah. I like that you keep using that yeah. term because I like, I, I like think that's that. what's fundamental. I mean, you know, Camille Polly is like one of the, the archetypal examples of this. People have had a hard time categorizing her politically. Some people, she is, you know, of the left or at least liberal in many regards, but other people are quick to like basically accuse her of being almost far right, you know, and she's been doing that since the nineties. And I think it's, mm -hmm. it just goes to show, you know, if, if you prioritize truth telling, really getting beneath, um, you know, social realities and not flinching away from the truth of those realities, even if it goes against a, a more sacrosanct narrative, um, yeah. then you're going to defy, you're going to defy people's narratives and people's categorizations. You're going to come out as transgressive. It's going to be a natural, a it's going to be a natural outcome rather than a calculated one. Uh, absolutely. You know what I, I mean? I see that as something that you- Like Pop are, Magic got yeah. dropped from a lot of bookstores after the Manson thing happened. You know what oh, I really? mean? Yeah. And it's like, yeah. so, and some people still won't stock it. Uh, you know, some people would say that is pretty much uh, a self-fulfilling prophecy I created by focusing on so much on like band or like you said, these type of archetypes. But um, if the book becomes dangerous to certain people because of him or anything like that, then th then that's it. I mean, I, I, w I would like to say that, you know, I wrote Pop Magic as a sort of interlude to an um, a certain 
career that I would like to follow. I don't really want to talk about, but um, mm-hmm. it, it was supposed to kind of be my intro to say, look, here are the tools, you know, of what you're going to see unfold for me for the next few years. And I want you to, to have this as the start and the beginning of what I want to give. Yeah, absolutely. Well, that might be a good note to, to end on. Um, yeah. If anyone is, is listening, you know, um, I have no socials, but you can always write me fan mail at alexkazemi.com. Love letters. If you're listening, <laughs> if you feel any sense of resonance or anything. Yeah, that's how I first you. got in touch with Alex. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It was so uh, cool seeing all those synchronicities. Yeah, no, there's been a lot of synchronicities leading up, leading up to this episode. Fuck yeah. I-